We have to. It's a board meeting. And oh. we're yes. <laughs> yes. Let's trust the rules, right? <laughs> Very good. Okay, good morning and welcome all to our Missouri Western State University Board of Governors Retreat. Uh, before we do begin, I want to remind everyone that this is an official Board of Governors meeting. We are live streamed and being recorded. Your mics are hot and on, so please remember that. Quick housekeeping item. Uh, if you are in need of a restroom, please exit this, head down to the left, and you'll find them at the end of the hallway. To our governors, as we begin, um, we acknowledge your dedication and greatly appreciate your service on the Board of Governors. Together, we are moving Missouri Western forward with clear direction and sure purpose, an effort that would not be possible without your guidance and oversight. So let's get started. First, with introductions. Okay, so with our introductions, let me first introduce our Board of Governors. We have with us today Lee Tiemann, who is our chair. Rick Eversold is our vice chair. He will be joining us shortly. He is actually getting a vaccine as we speak, so congratulations to Rick. Uh, we have Kayla Schoonover here. Thank you. We have Al Lendis, who will also be joining us a little bit later. We have Lisa Norton, who will also be joining us a little bit later. We have a new governor, uh, Robert Willeman. We're happy to have you here with us today. And then we have Hannah Berry, our student governor. So welcome to you. Uh, in terms of me and my cabinets, uh, I'm Elizabeth Kennedy. I'm the interim president. We have with us today, Dr. Douglas Davenport, provost. We have Mr. Daryl Morrison, CFO, uh, vice president of finance and administration. A newest, one of our newest members to cabinet is Dr. Melissa Mace, who is our new vice president of enrollment management. Um, we have Mr. Josh Looney, uh, oh, Josh, over there. Over there. Uh, we have Logan Jones, who is also here. We also have Ms. Kelly Douglas, who has just joined us at the beginning of the semester as our new general counsel. And we have Kent Heyer with us, who is here in terms in representing our marketing and communications director. And we have Mr. Steve Johnston, who is serving as our external uh, direct external relations director. Uh, so thank you to my cabinet. Uh, just take a time out for all the hard work you've done to prepare this to get us ready for this day. I also want to thank the board for so generously giving us so much of your time today. We promise to be respectful of that and to keep our schedule as close to it as we move throughout our day. I've also promised Dr. Laney that I would be very respectful of his time. So let me begin with a preface before introducing him. At Cabinet, as we prepared for this day, I shared the need for providing some type of informational orientation session for our board. We have a very junior board in the sense that the tenure of our folks is very early. And we do need to get everyone to be on the same page and on the same playing field to learn about Missouri Western State University and to become better educated as board members to be as effective as possible in their roles. However, Doing that kind of deep reflection requires both internal and external perspectives. And what better way for us to begin our day than to gain that external insight, to hear from one of our most valued and important partners whose collaborations are truly instrumental to the success of Missouri Western. And what better choice then to kick off our retreat uh, by beginning with the CEO of Mosaic, Dr. Mark Laney, and to hear his perspectives on Missouri Western. And although he needs no introductions, we do have some folks who are relatively new to our area. So let me share a little bit of his bio with you. Mark Laney, Dr. Mark Laney, CEO, joined Mosaic Life Care in 2009. And prior to this, he served for 20 years at Cook Children's Health Care System, 
eight of those years as the president of Cook Children's Physicians Network. Dr. Laney earned a Bachelor of Arts from the University of North Texas in Denton, Texas, received a Doctor of Medicine from the University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston, and completed a Pediatric Neurology Fellowship at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. In 2000, he received a Master's of Science in Medical Management at the University of Tex Texas at Dallas. Dr. Laney is the former president of the Mayo Clinic Alumni Association. He dedicates his time by sitting on boards, including the Community Alliance of St. Joseph and the American Hospital Association Region 6 Policy Board. He is past chairman of both the St. Joseph Metro Chamber of Commerce, as well as the Missouri Hospital Association. He and his wife, Margaret, Mary Margaret, and their daughter, Jordan, are world travelers. When he is at home, he enjoys reading and spending time with the family's two golden retrievers, uh, Gabriella and Genevieve. So without further ado, let me introduce Dr. Lee. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good, good morning. It's this a real honor to be asked to uh, spend a few minutes with you. And uh, I think my, my topic will resonate uh, with you today. And in general, I, I think the heading would be uh, a pathway to excellence. And uh, when I interviewed here uh, 12 years ago, I was on a tour with the, uh, the chairman of the board and he asked me, um, well, what do you think about our hospital? And I said, your hospital's dirty. And he looked at me like I, you know, how dare you say that? You're interviewing for the CEO job. But the fact was, it was, it was dirty. And that at that point in time, Mosaic, which was Heartland then, did not have an attention to detail and did not have a commitment to excellence in everything that they did. So I came in and, you know, a new CEO and, and we, we created a culture of a commitment to excellence in every single thing that we do. And that's why when you go to our hospital today, it's immaculately clean. The gardens are beautiful outside. The staff is hopefully amazingly friendly and, and there's just a great attention to detail. So I would encourage you as board members, new board members to start off with that commitment to excellence. Um, you know, we, we share so much in common. Our industries are really facing very, very similar challenges. Uh, you face very significant decreases in reimbursement. We're under continuous financial pressure to provide a higher level of care with more technology, with less funding. And it's just very, very difficult. Obviously, we both have had tremendous disruptions in our missions relative to uh, COVID. And uh, this has been, uh, I'll be totally honest with you, this has been the most difficult professional year I've had in my entire life. Uh, the pressure uh, upon our caregivers has been immense. But I told Doug uh, before we got up, there's light at the end of the tunnel. Today, we have fewer COVID patients in our hospital than uh, since August of, of last year. And we're continuing to see those numbers decline. But you, you face pressures with enrollment and changing viewpoints about higher education and about student debt. So we're, we're, uh, we're tied at the hip. You know, we're not only just across the street from each other, but we, we share similar challenges. And we're both in the ind industry of intellectual capital. The most important thing that we have, it's not a widget, it's not a product, it's intellectual capital. So my heart goes out to you when I read about you in the newspaper, and I hope your heart goes out to me when you read about us in the, in, in the newspaper. We have more uh, common uh, than, than you might think. Um, we have had a tremendous commitment to Missouri Western long before I got here. 
the majority of our nurses are uh, uh, graduate from your nursing program. We have many, many physicians that did their undergraduate work here. And, and so we rely tremendously on those students that make healthcare uh, a choice uh, for their profession. Um, we, we love having Missouri Western students and because they're so important to us through our history, we've made some significant donations to the university. Uh, shortly after I got here, you just finished your new science building, but didn't have all the lab equipment that you needed. And I think we spent about $500,000 to equip those labs. Uh, and that was just a, a great start. Uh, you know, subsequently, uh, under the leadership of Carol Raver, we endowed a population health uh, professor and you started a, a, one of the first bachelor's program in the United States. And that is going to continue to be a cutting edge program, certainly is going to be a prominent theme with the new administration. And then finally, we had an opportunity to team up with our foundation and, and uh, make a donation for the new simulation lab, which, uh, you know, when I trained a zillion years ago, you know, your simulation lab was somebody that was, was having a heart attack or had arrested. It wasn't a, a mannequin. You learned actually, that's not a great, you know, that's, that's trial by fire. So anyway, uh, we, we have shared many syner uh, synergies and it's been a mutually beneficial relationship and we have tremendous respect for Missouri Western and for their students and are so glad that um, you're across the street. So let me uh, spend the last part of my talk just giving you a little bit of unasked, unsolicited advice about uh, how to be a good board member. And I have served on many, many, many national, regional and local boards. And I think I understand the, the ideal and the best practices of that. And I can tell you my board today is the most wonderful board I've ever worked with. And we've worked really, really hard. Um, number one is everything rises and falls on leadership. The single most important job that a board has is to choose the president. Number one, we had a bit of a hiccup. And uh, the thing about executive search is that it's like speed dating on steroids. Who would, who would meet somebody two or three times and then ask them to get married? Uh, it, it, but, it, but it is what it is. And sometimes, most of the time it works and sometimes it doesn't. So this next time, it's gotta be a slam dunk, a slam dunk. And remember, that is the most important goal you have. Second, today, when you're in a board retreat, what do you need to be focused on? You need to fo be focused on strategy, strategy. You are responsible for high level, high level oversight of operations, but your primary job is not to get down into the nitty gritty of operations. That's where boards, kind of stumble upon themselves, but you still have to have high level oversight. So as you're having your discussions today, do this, think about, am I looking over beyond the horizon? Am I thinking strategically to position the university in the best place to be optimally successful in a new paradigm? The other thing I would say is best practice for board, and I have certainly enjoyed this in my 12 years, is it is absolutely imperative that all of you are behind this woman and are committed to supporting her, giving her wise counsel, but supporting her, especially in a difficult time. We've got leadership, we've got leadership going on, we've got financial pressures going on, we've got a pandemic going on, we've got a lot going on. She needs your support. The other thing, 
is you need to come to these meetings prepared. I know it's no fun to get a big packet full of information at home, but coming prepared is part of being a great board member. Second is actively leaning in and discussing things boldly, even when the topic may be uncomfortable, is your role. If you go out to the parking lot and stand there for 30 minutes to have a discussion that you did not have in the boardroom, you are not performing in an optimum way. It might be okay to have a discussion in the parking lot, but if there's a real issue, it should be right here. It should be right here. And the value of a board member that is bold to, to be able to put the university first and be able, you know, we can talk about difficult things in a non-difficult way. We can be respectful, but if we don't talk about it, we, we will fall short. Be transparent. Be bold, be positive, and lean in to change. My world has completely changed. And what Mosaic looks like coming out the other end of this COVID crisis, it's going to be different. We're doing a thousand times more telemedicine visits than we ever did before COVID. That's not going to go away. Your world's going to change. So in conclusion, uh, what a great opportunity to serve your community in, a, in an amazing way to uh, serve an amazing university. And what a privilege, what a privilege it is for me to come to share a few thoughts today. And if there's ever anything that Mosaic can do for you, Dr. Kennedy, or to support the university, please do not hesitate to ask. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Laney. That was a really good to hear your perspective and I appreciate you sharing that with us. Um, so a couple of things before we get into the purpose of the treat. I thought I would share a little bit of perspective about my role. Um, first of all, my responsibilities. When I think of my responsibilities, part of this is who am I interacting with? Who am I working with on a day-to-day -day basis? So when I talk about the internal constituencies, here we're talking internal to the university students, faculty, staff, those kinds of folks, administrators, and of course the boards. We have the Board of Governors, the, the Foundation Board, and our Alumni Board. Those are the internal uh, constituencies. The external stakeholders in my Board of Governors reports are first to these under my community engagement sections. Here we're talking about business industry leaders, agencies, governmental folks, educational folks, city, county, state, federal, alumni, the movers and the shakers. These um, are the people that I work with as an ambassador of our university. So what am I doing? I am working, connecting, supporting, integrating, mentoring, fostering, and most importantly, leading, providing the necessary leadership to keep us moving forward together. My relationship with the Board of Governors, they're my boss. And as such, my role is to make sure that the university is functioning operating efficiently and with great effectiveness. And that we have strategies, plans in place and are moving those forward with precision, thoughtfulness and evaluation. If the board's role is to preserve the mission and vision of the university, it is my responsibility to ensure that we are working to fill, fulfill each of those. And then finally, communication. As the board knows, with the start of the semester, I have been uh, begun sending bi-weekly bi communications to each of you with updates and highlights and reminders about going on at the university. But the purpose is to keep everyone informed. That's the general communication. In a more specific sense, I speak frequently with Chair Tiemann and often include Vice Chairman Ebersold to discuss items most germane to the roles on the board. Next slide. 
So what is our purpose today? Basically two functions. First of all, to provide you as board members with basic information as to the structure and the function of the university, answering the question, how does the university work? Each of our vice presidents and other cabinet members will provide a brief presentation on their respective areas to give you a better idea of how things work at the university. Secondly, to start with a set of reference materials for you to assist you in your work as a member of the Board of Governors. This is your notebook, which contains all the information about the vice president's areas, as well as specific materials um, for each board member. So with that, with that, we're ready to begin. Slide, please. And we will begin with Dr. Davenport. Good morning. It is my pleasure to welcome you to our campus today. It's, it's great to see wonderful weather. And uh, I will say this, that I'm grateful to Dr. Laney for his remarks and, and the fact that we have shared history, we have shared interests, and we have shared futures. I, I also appreciated his reference to our strategic plan entitled Pathways to Excellence. And I am grateful today that we can think about Missouri Western and its future and talk about how we currently function, how we operate. And it's my deep pleasure to serve as the provost and vice president for academic and student affairs. At this point, I'm going to speak briefly about our academic affairs division and hopefully be, be ready to answer questions that you might have about how we operate or what we do. And so I'm going to, to uh, provide a, a brief overview. It's very difficult when you look at academic affairs to summarize what we do in a way that's informative without being exhaustive and somewhat overwhelming, but I will seek to do that, operate at a high level. And I also wanna give you an opportunity to ask questions during this next few minutes. So first of all, we're gonna talk briefly about the role of academic affairs. And so we'll, we'll get to the next slide, hopefully. There we go. And so the role of academic affairs really, I, I summarize it in three ways. It could be done differently, but I think about what is our role first and foremost and it is focused upon what we do for students because they are the reason we are here. We should never forget that academic affairs and the university more generally exists to serve our students and our region, the people of our state. And so we provide transformative educational experiences, which encompasses a whole range of activities that actually happen oftentimes outside the classroom, but those are a part of who we are and what we do. And of course, effective academic programs. Uh, when students come here, they're looking for not only an experience, but they are looking for a credential. And uh, so it is our uh, responsibility first and foremost to do those two things. It is also our responsibility to help fulfill. Thank you. Our, our responsibility to fulfill the university mission as it relates to applied learning. That is a statewide mission mandated by the Missouri General Assembly. And so we're pleased to be actively engaged every day in things that are considered applied learning. This is a differentiator for our institution in many, many ways. And we take great pride in that responsibility. Finally, it is to support student success. And, and that means success in all sorts of ways. Most importantly, it means academic success. That is that students persist in complete degrees and credentials as they desire to do. For some students, of course, their success looks different. They are not here to get a credential, but they are here to have some sort of an experience. And so from that perspective, we are here to serve those interests of those students. 
So let me talk a little bit briefly about who we are, the people of academic affairs. And I'm going to give you, there we go, a brief overview. This is a snapshot from the fall semester of who we are in terms of faculty and staff. We have full-time faculty. It's 168 full-time faculty as of the fall. And this number of course changes semester by semester depending upon hires, resignations, et cetera. But this is where we are currently at the fall semester, part-time and adjunct faculty, which are so important to us. We have 112 and then 32 staff members across academic affairs. I will just tell you, and this may be a question that you would have is how does that compare to the past? And I think that's an important comparison given our financial situation. And, and so I would, I would say this, um, that compared from this year to last year, there, is a, there has been a reduction of 17% in the total uh, faculty employment at the university. Now let that sink in because the primary mission of this university is to provide academic uh, experiences. And yet we have reduced our faculty lines. And so that is part of the challenge that we have faced in addressing our financial uh, problems. And, and so we are working diligently to ensure that we can be efficient as you know, we'll talk a little bit about academic programs in just a minute, and that is also a part of this puzzle as well. And over time, let me just tell you that if you went back to 2017, in 2017, we had 30% more faculty. So let that sink in for you just a bit. And uh, so we have done significant work over the past year to uh, live within our means and to do a better job while still providing the same level of quality educational experiences for our students. That is no small task, but I believe we're up for it. I thought it would be good for you to just see pictures of some of our folks. And so I wanted to put, put a couple of slides up that include some key leaders that I'm pleased to work with. I believe that I get to work with the best team I've ever had. And uh, they, they bring, they actually bring a lot of joy um, to my heart. Uh, that's interesting. It's not often that case, but I, I think we've captured lightning in the bottle. And uh, so I'm pleased that I have Elise Hepworth, who is the interim vice provost this year, Dr. Yin To, Dr. Angela Grant, Sally Gibson leads our library services. Moving quickly, these are these are my the deans. Of course, one of them is with us today because he's wearing a second hat. That's Logan Jones. Dr. Jones is the dean of the College of Business and Professional Studies. Dr. Bashinsky is the interim dean of the Graduate School. Dr. Heyer, College of Liberal Arts, and Dr. Crystal Harris, who has taken on Yeoman's work not only as the interim dean of the College of Science and Health, but also as our campus-wide COVID coordinator, which. Um, that's a full-time job, to be really honest, and there are many days that she is working uh, into the night in, in an attempt to manage all of those responses that we have to have to ensure this campus is safe and healthy. So I just want to give a shout out to her. You, you know these individuals, but um, it's good to remind us. I also wanted then to give you a brief uh, overview. Here are academic leaders at the department level. And so with an academic institution, you have the deans that are your full-time administrators, of course, but you then have your academic leaders in your individual units. And these individuals are full-time faculty, but they also have some part-time administrative responsibilities. They play a important role. One of the most difficult jobs on a university campus is to serve as a department chair. And these individuals do it, and I'm grateful for their support and the work that they do. These are the uh, chairpersons in the College of Business and Professional Studies. In the College of Liberal Arts, we have these four chairpersons as well, Dr. Shauna Harris, Dr. Brian Cronk, Dr. Ed Taylor, and Dr. Nathaniel May. And then finally, with the College of Science and Health, we have uh, 
I, and you have seen Dr. Mark Mills as the department chair in biology. He has been a, a key leader in our Prairie Lands project and, and uh, very grateful for his, his work. Dr. Mike Ducey in chemistry. Uh, he has been engaged heavily in our community as well. Uh, Evan Neunert and Dr. Alex Zatoli serve as co-chairs in the Department of Computer Science, Math and Physics. Dr. Reagan Dodd in health professions. You also see her a lot at Chiefs Camp because she is not only our faculty activity rep, or uh, I'm sorry, faculty at, uh, athletic rep uh, for our university, but she also is uh, manages the internships that happen during the summer with Chiefs Camp. So she is an integral part of that. And then uh, Dr. Jacqueline Gentry, who has taken on responsibilities, the chair of nursing. These are all uh, colleagues for whom I, I stand in great debt because they, they do a lot of work in running the day-to-day -day operations of our academic enterprise. And we could not survive without their uh, full support. And, and I appreciate everything that they do. Now, in terms of our academic programs, this is the fall 2020 uh, list. Now, let me just give you some insight here. You'll notice that uh, we have two certificates, four associates, 65 bachelor's degrees. Now, that's a little misleading because if you looked at the list of programs um, in terms of concentrations and majors and whether it's a bachelor of uh, uh, of arts or a bachelor of science or a BSBA, there's, there's a number of degree programs and so if you were to look at that list, that, that would extend to over 100. But in terms of basic programs that we offer, it was 65. As you know, we went through the very difficult work this last year of reducing that number strategically and significantly. And so we cut over 50 programs and concentrations. And so uh, that number will be lower this next year because of the cuts that we have made as we're phasing out programs. We also currently have 17 master's programs that were on the book in, uh, in, in the fall. We are consistently and constantly thinking about what are the academic programs that are in our inventory? What should they be? What new things should we be offering so that we are attractive to students and we're serving the region's workforce needs? That's a constant conversation. It always takes time to get to where we wanna go, but that is part and parcel of what we are engaged in. And I wanted to list just a set of the things that are part of the functions or the units, some of which you are familiar with. Uh, obviously the library is a key academic support piece for the entire campus. We talk about grants and research, Missouri Western, has some uh, externally funded grants, but not a large number. But that is an area for us to continue to explore. Are there grants that are out there that would advance Missouri Western providing additional support and increasing our ability to serve the region? Institutional research is a huge component, but one that's almost never thought about until we're asking about data. <laughs> and you have within your board packet today, the fact book, uh, I'm sorry, the fact sheet from the fall. And let me just say this, that the, uh, the data that we have is so crucial because we have to make decisions that are data informed. To make decisions based on anecdotal evidence or impressions is simply not acceptable. And it is crucial that institutional research be prepared to provide us with data that is accessible, that's accurate, and that we can understand. So that is, I am very grateful for what we've been doing in that area. Of course, assessment and accreditation. We are accredited by the Higher Learning Commission, which is one of six regional accrediting bodies. Absent uh, regional accreditation, institutions are not eligible for Title IV funding. So it is absolutely essential that we maintain good standing with the Higher Learning Commission. We are preparing for next year our uh, uh, assurance argument, which is our mid-cycle report to them. We are fully accredited by the Higher Learning Commission. We anticipate that continuing with no problems. That is despite the fact that we have had to make significant cuts in so many ways. And believe me, the Higher Learning Commission was 
very engaged in our discussions early on about what it would look like at this institution. And uh, there was the potential that they would step in and do monitoring, which generally means an institution is not able to manage its own affairs appropriately. And you read the newspapers on a regular basis of institutions where they are under sanction of some sort from their accrediting body. Missouri Western is not, we, have, we are in good standing and they see us as having a plan to address our financial problems and they are pleased with our progress on this. Uh, I, I want to mention a couple of other things and you notice applied learning over here. Because that is our mission, we absolutely have to have activities and functions that are carried out that support applied learning. And that comes out of my office. And that is one of the things that uh, our interim vice provost is involved in. Um, Center for Teaching and Learning is of great interest because it supports both faculty and staff professional development. I just briefly want to say one other thing here about how we work together with the other divisions. And I start off with student affairs, um, which is, of course, a separate division, but one I'm also responsible for. Student affairs is, is uh, so crucial to what we do on our campus. One of the places that we have collaborated very effectively is with regard to our COVID response. So residence life and housing has been a key part of that that has been coordinated with student affairs and with others. So I just wanna say that they have played an important part in what we're doing. We partner with them in so many, so many ways. Enrollment management is a new division to our, to our operations. It's wonderful because we get to talk about student success and student enrollment. So, so we will continue to work together. We have just begun some very exciting conversations about the future and we are committed together to see students succeed. Advancement, of course, we have always worked with them closely because many folks are looking for ways to support the institution. And when we talk about the academic programs and needs of our students, it becomes very evident that people can provide support in ways that's truly a lifeline. And uh, I am grateful for that. We work closely, of course, with Daryl and finance and administration. Uh, you, don't, you don't deal with the budget without working very closely with, with this office. And so we are, we are pleased to say that we're not siloed. We are working collaboratively as a cabinet in so many ways across all of our divisions. I wanna briefly touch on these initiatives and then I will uh, give you opportunity if you need to ask questions. We can talk about anything you would like, but I mentioned the, the, the importance of an institutional research. That has been a priority of mine for about two to three years. And I am so pleased that Dr. To, Yin To, and Dr. Angela Grant in institutional research have, have taken on the challenge of doing more with our data. And we collect lots of data, like lots of institutions. We, we have a ton of data. Accessing that data and making it available is, a, is, is much more challenging. They have been doing excellent work in that regard, and I'm, I'm appreciative of, of their work. The master academic plan is, is in progress. We are, I, I'm reviewing uh, uh, that first draft of it. I'm very excited about what is in that master academic plan because it gives us, the, it gives us guidance for the future in terms of what we will look like as an academic institution. Related to that, we're also engaged, of course, as you know, in an academic program review process. This is something that needs to happen regularly. It did not happen here. Um, it, it did happen some in the past. If you went back you know, 15 years ago, Missouri Department of Higher Ed mandated regular program review. That went away. Um, there are reasons for that that have nothing to do with uh, institutions, but we are taking the proactive step as requested and expected from last year's uh, work with uh, our retrenchment activities to step up and do academic program review on a regular cycle with all programs being reviewed, looking for quality, efficiency, and student success. Finally, I would like to mention something that was also in last year's report from the president to the board with regard to the honors program, which 
We have had a long history with an honors program, and I'm pleased to say that we are doing a major revision to the honors program, and I have tasked our interim vice provost and the director of the honors program with making that one more efficient so that it costs less and that it aligns with our institutional mission so that applied learning and service learning are parts of what every student who's in the honors program does. So that is, that is underway, I'm excited about. It. I've seen a first draft just this morning of that and I'm very pleased that that is underway. With that, I will be happy to answer questions. I, I think I talked very fast. <laughs> I, I wanted to make sure that I gave you plenty of time, but uh, are there questions that I could I can answer at this point? Dr. Davenport, uh, you, you touched on uh, the process of, of uh, reducing some of our programs. If maybe you could talk a little bit about uh, new programs that, that mm -hmm. we've added uh, in the last year or considering adding, and maybe... Uh, uh, just a brief overview of the process that the institution goes through in evaluating whether there's a need for a new program and maybe even how like any industry or stakeholders that would like to have a discussion about maybe some needs that they might mm -hmm. have and, and how that collaboration works uh, uh, for creating new programs to, uh, to meet changing needs. Yeah, thank you. That's a that's an excellent question. and. And, and because academic programs are at the heart of what we provide to our students, it is crucial that it meet two expectations. First of all, that there is a need in the marketplace out in the, our region because we exist to serve our region. But secondly, is there sufficient interest on the part of students? So those are two questions that must be addressed. The third one that is equally important but is the third one is, can we afford it? What are the costs associated with a new or revised program? Those, are, those questions are all important. Some are easier to answer than others. And as we have this past year engaged in the process of uh, eliminating or reducing our program inventory, we all know you cannot cut your way to success. And part of that is what are the new programs that we should be looking at and offering? So for instance, we, we have a new program, uh, a bachelor's in law program that I think has the potential to provide, uh, to be very attractive. It would be the, it's the third one in the country. So this, this is not something that other institutions in our state are offering or even in our region. So it makes us distinctive on that front. That is now up and running. We have a new Bachelor of Applied Arts. in pro, in, It's in uh, Performing and Cinematic Arts. I believe I've got that right. So I, uh, but, but the, that's primarily a cinema degree. But here's where it's unique. It is, it is built around the areas of production uh, not just film production, but special effects. There is a whole industry that is engaged in, in uh, this area. So we have this new Bachelor of Applied Arts, which is a unique degree, different from anything that we have had in the past, and one that we can live within our means and provide. So those are two examples that we have already engaged in. We have, we have some others. We are looking at an undergraduate degree in cybersecurity. Uh, I'm very pleased that we have an alumni who is a, a renowned expert in the field who is working with our faculty to, to create that program because we know there is need and we must provide uh, a, a program if we can. We believe that we will be able to do so. So to your other part of your question of how would we get input, how can, how can those out in the community, the stakeholders, how can they be engaged? One, we have advisory boards for several of our areas and it is my expectation that we develop more advisory boards to provide that kind of input to say, here's an area of content that really we need to meet. Um, I, I look over at Governor Landis, who has been involved with our engineering technology program for many years and uh, trying to give us input on where our programs need to make adjustments. And so this is part and parcel of that process. Our Craig School of Business has an outstanding advisory board 
And, and we are making adjustments and refinements of our academic inventory uh, in part due to that kind of feedback. So it is crucial that we reach out and those advisory boards are an important way to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. That was excellent. Uh, next, we have Mr. Daryl uh, Morrison, uh, Finance and Administration. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to be with us today. Uh, it's already been uh, reiterated, but uh, I'd also uh, like to thank Dr. Davenport for giving a little bit of his time to me because as being from the deep south, it takes me twice as long to say something as it does uh, most people here. So I, I'd like to say thank you, Doug, for that. So so I always appreciate it. We, we do have, I, I've got several slides and in your book, there is an organizational chart and uh, much like what Dr. Kennedy has done and much like uh, Dr. Davenport, uh, I just wanna walk through an overview of our areas. And this should be something similar to what you see in your chart. I'm not going to, uh, in your book rather, I'm not going to go through each piece of it, but this is uh, my kingdom, if you will. <laughs> this is my area that uh, uh, I have the responsibility for. And there are quite a few things in there uh, for us. Uh, as we look at and just break down individual areas, one of the main things that we do, and we'll start with the finance piece of my job and then move into some of the other aspects of it. One is the oversight of purchasing and contracts. And generally speaking, this is a vacancy that we have uh, on our campus and we've had it for some time now uh, regarding an associate or controller over uh, finance administration. And as Dr. Davenport wears multiple hats and as Dr. Looney wears multiple hats and as Dr. Jones wears multiple hats, we're all wearing multiple hats right now. So that is a key position though uh, that we are uh, without on campus and have been without. But purchasing and contracts, you know, we're trying to preserve, uh, um, you know, the best, best practices following state university guidelines, federal guidelines on our purchases, trying to make sure we're getting the best values. All of those types of things fall into purchasing and contracts. And everything is centralized through this area. Accounting services also would be under the purview of the controller, the associate VP, but this takes care of all of our financial information. It's everything from paying checks, uh, writing checks, if you will, to uh, paying all of our vendors through accounts payable, but, but it's much more than that. It's, it's complying with all the regulatory requirements uh, of the state, of the university, of the federal government, it is compiling all the financial information for the university. It is working with the auditors. It is doing all of those things. And it's basically trying to um, just tell us where our money goes and watch how our money is spent and all of those things, the normal accounting services. And for an entity this large, this is quite a task, okay? Uh, the other thing that we do, we're responsible for fixed assets on our campus. We're responsible for tracking everything. If you look under probably these microphones, these cameras, they all have little tag numbers on them, right? And so they say property of the university. So that's another one of our tasks uh, that we are charged with. The other thing and a very important uh, aspect of what we do is working with our students. We would all like for college to be free and it may be one day, <laughs> uh, given the direction in some things, but at this time it is not. And so we have to work with our students uh, on their accounts. And that's a big task. We is centralized billing 
for, for the campus community. We take care of that. We receive their funds. We work with them on payment plans. We do all of those things. And at this time of year, one of the major things that we do is issue 1098 T's to our students, which helps them with their tax credits and things like that. Okay. But that's one of the things that we do uh, in, in this. We also work with delinquencies uh, on that, I might add, okay? Financial aid, it's just simply what it says, right? It is assisting students, assisting their families with the financial aid process. That's everything with assistance we're needed to fill out the FAFSA, the federal uh, form to apply for student financial aid. It's the awarding of scholarships. It is all of those things. We work with borrowers to, uh, if a student becomes defunct uh, on a loan that they receive, we work with them, we reach out, all of those things, okay? And this is, uh, while of course, again, the laws and regulations and policies, which are ever changing, I might add, okay? But that's financial aid. Our budget department, this is a new department for this campus. Uh, this campus did not have this. Uh, previously, budget was rolled up uh, in some of the other areas. Uh, as you know, given our financial situation, this is one thing that we did not long after I got here under with the approval of uh, President Wilson at that time, was to roll out the budget office, have it as separate, unassociated with the finance piece of it so that they could work more, as Dr. Davenport alluded to, the departments out on campus. There was that one stop, if you will. And so that's what we're doing at this point in time, help them with their budget process. We have uh, tons of reports and things that we have to fill out for the state level and for the federal government as well. But it's really about collaboration uh, for them. The other thing that is uh, in my ear is human resources, okay? And human resources is a lot more in today's environment than just recruiting someone, getting them to fill out some, a couple of forms and moving on. Human resources on our campus is not only the recruitment, the onboarding, the offboarding, it is also uh, in get involved with the payroll processes. It is working with many Title IX issues with lots of things that are involved in this. They coordinate all our fringe benefits for the campus community uh, and work individually with many, many people uh, on our campus and with that personal touch while also looking at policies and procedures across our campus to make sure we're in compliance with all the federal and state uh, laws. Engineering and infrastructure. This is the next piece to our puzzle. And another place I might add that we're missing a key component. We do not currently have a CIO on our campus. Uh, this position was vacant when I arrived. Uh, had the gentleman had retired not long before that. And this is still a, uh, an area that we're missing an associate vice pr uh, president in. Uh, and so I'm working with the directors over those three areas, uh, one of which is inf engineering and infrastructure. That's all our networking, our cabling, and uh, all of those things across our campus. It's our security uh, for what we're doing. Uh, Fred and I were discussing this morning because uh, just to give you an idea of a colleague of mine, uh, their campus was recently hacked. Uh, and so he's been working with that. It's not directly his area, but it's all hands on deck type approach, but they were hacked and whoever hacked them currently possesses all of their social security numbers and all of that, they can't make payroll. It's a major ordeal. And so after visiting with him on my way in this morning, my first call when I got to the office was to Fred to say, this isn't gonna to happen to us, is it? <laughs> and so uh, it is not, but but there nothing's 100% though, I guess is my point. But Fred, 
uh, as a leader in this area is working hard to make sure and ensure that we're doing what we need to, but they provide the support to technology for our delivery methods, things like that. The other one is programming and software support. Uh, we have a learning management system, Canvas, that's used you know, by the academic department. We support that. Uh, we help them with training, setting up things for them. Uh, we also, the ERP, what our system runs on, uh, Banner, uh, they support that. Uh, there's customizable reporting. There's all these things to up, to train and work with and install and all of those things, the software on our campus. And the third category then is the technology support piece. We have a help desk on this campus where students reach out, they can drop in, uh, work with us, faculty if they need support, staff members if they need support, we'll go to them, we'll do desktop training, we'll do whatever it takes to get people where they need to be in this area. And Corey, who's over there behind the camera, this is her area. So you wanna know what she does besides sit over there and help us with this, that's one of the things, okay? So that's technology. The physical plan. Uh, led by Brian Atkins, uh, he's the director, and there are all these things that fall under that umbrella of the physical plan. And that's a lot for a campus our size. We have over 700 acres of land, multiple building, buildings on it, and one of the issues, as we all know, are our buildings. We have good ones, we have not so good ones, right? And so those are the things that uh, we work with on a daily basis. Our grounds crew have been out here uh, at, starting at 4 a.m. for two or three days this week so that we could hold classes, so that we could work, okay? So it's vital, and I'm so appreciative of, of, of that crew for getting out here and doing those things for us, the unsung heroes of the campus, if you will. But all the physical plant things, and you see what they are. The last thing is the University Police Department. They provide safety, security. It's nice to know that they're out patrolling campus, that they're walking campus, that they're doing the things, they're interacting across campus. And Joe Volkmer uh, does a, a good job leading that, that group. Not only do they do the policing things, but they have also become a, a great resource for our students because students just visit with them and talk about their issues that they're having trouble sometimes and things like that. And so Jill and them are not just walking around, making sure not part, you, you know, you're illegally parked. They're doing a lot more than that. And that's what I want to emphasize, okay? Any questions as I've gone through my area, because I want to close with just a few things and, and talk about a few things, okay? Given my time to help bring you up to speed, if you will. That's an overview of our area. There's one resounding, resounding theme of my area, and it's one word, support. That's what my area is about. We support the faculty, we support the students, and we support the staff. Everything that's up there, that's what it's about, is to support them. That means from budgeting, it is allocating the, the right amount of resources. From accounting, it's providing the guidance so that we stay out of, if you will, hot water with some areas. It is about making sure that the air conditioning is working and the lights are burning. It is about making sure that we have a safe campus environment every day. It's about working with their students to get the aid that they need to help them with their payment plans. That's what we do, it's support. But our support function does not come in today's environment without challenges and or opportunities. And I'd like to touch on these. I'd be remiss to, to not, as the CFO of this university, to not remind everyone 
that as a university, we are still in a state of financial emergency. That was put in at almost a year ago now with the adoption uh, of a motion by this board because of our financial situation. Uh, we're still struggling. We've made strides, we've made improvements, but we're not there. I think we, when, when sometimes things start going better, everybody forgets about the bigger picture. And so this is a reminder uh, 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 to the board that we're not quite there. We are improving though, okay? But we're still in a state of financial emergency. What other challenges do we have? We have challenges on our policies and procedures. The board has addressed some of them over the past 18 months that I've been on campus, but we still have much work to do. I, I don't want to be overly negative about some things this morning. However, the fact remains that we have several changes that we really need to make from our policies and procedures, from our overall university governance structure. Okay, you say, why are you talking about this and not the president? Well, the, re the, re the president, first of all, doesn't know I'm talking about it until right now, so I'm probably getting an evil eye. But secondly, <laughs> but secondly, because that's the other part of my job, finance and administration. And it's about the administration of university policies and procedures. And that's in my, in my wheelhouse, as they say. We have many policies and things that made a lot of sense when Daryl graduated college in 1985. They don't make as much sense in 2021, I should say. And so those are things that I know Dr. Kennedy is working on along with our new uh, general counsel and others. And we started down this road and we'll continue to work on those. But we've got to look at our governance structure. We've got to make it as efficient and as effective as it can so that we can move this university ahead. Sometimes things uh, get bogged up and we've got to push them ahead, okay? And so that's just one thought that we need to look at. The second thing deals with personnel. As I went through uh, my slides, uh, I noted just a couple of people, key people, for an organization that we're missing here. You say, why don't you hire them? Well, we're back to the financial thing, first of all, okay? That's one aspect of it. The second part of it though, and I wanna make the board aware of this, is recruitment. It's really difficult. I found it difficult for us to recruit sometimes to, to our campus. You say, why? Primarily because of pay and where we're at as a campus. We have compensation issues all over our campus and I wanna make the board aware of this. You say, we'll fix it. Well, we can't fix all of it or any of it because of this. Let me give you just one example of what I'm talking about. The last cost of living raise, I think on this campus occurred in 2018. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. In 2018, the minimum wage in the state of Missouri was $7.85. In 2021, the minimum wage in the state of Missouri is $10.30. That factors out to $4,775 per year over that time, not over that time, that's a gap difference given a 1950-hour work week, uh, work year, okay? So let's say $5,000 for simplicity. Here's what's happened. The bottom has came up because of that on some area. Our students, a lot of other people, right? Minimum wage is there. Our people who came in three, four, five, ten 10 years ago at four or $5 above what minimum wage was started at salary are now finding themselves in a situation 
to where they're making 20 cents more than minimum wage. And as that has gone up, so has the other piece. There's been no raises on the other. So if you adjust this a little bit, there's the compression that we have. We find on our faculty oftentimes that when we lose someone, what happens is that it costs us more to replace a full professor as an assistant or an associate oftentimes than the full professor position. So we have that compression that has built. So what does that mean? It means that we have a higher than average turnover rate on our campus because people are looking for other opportunities. It means we can't recruit people that we need to recruit. And it's terrible for morale. So I just want to make you aware of, uh, of some of the issues that we deal with on the campus, because I think that's our job to make the board aware of what we're grappling with on a daily basis. The third, the, the fourth thing I'd like to talk about is our funding structure. Our funding structure primarily consists of two components. It consists of state appropriations and it consists of tuition and fees. I appreciate what the state does for us. I appreciate our local representatives and their support. They're very supportive of Missouri Western. However, given the pandemic and given what has happened over the years with changes in state government, higher ed is not where it needs to be, in my opinion. Okay, and we've lost ground. In our state appropriations, as you know it, we're down over $2 million for the fiscal year uh, in that. So we've kind of got that yo-yo thing <laughs> going with state appropriations, right? So that, that, that brings us into a, a strange funding structure. Nothing we can control, nothing we can do about that other than make you aware that that's one of the things that we deal with. The second thing deals with tuition and fees. Tuition and fees uh, are uh, a challenge. The, we talked about this, for those of you that have been on the board, we talked about the Higher Education uh, Funding Act, the HESPA Act, uh, that's in place uh, in the state that prohibits you to uh, raise tuition and fees. Uh, very much, but let me tell you, let me share with you just a couple of things about that. Uh, number one, the average tuition at a higher ed institution on an annual basis is $7,694. We at Missouri Western are at 7,272 based on that formula. So what does that mean? That means that we are 13th, we're at the bottom in the state on tuition and fees, okay? I would argue that we're not at the bottom in the quality of education in the state, that we're well above 13th, way above with the quality of education that we have. But that's a challenge. Why am I bringing that up today? I'm bringing it up today because we have an opportunity soon to make an adjustment. When, in the HESFA law, there's a, there, if we're able to reduce, uh, if you re receive a reduction in state appropriation, there's an opportunity to you to increase your tuition and fee, okay? Some of our local competitors are way more than $1,500 annually than we are. Uh, we, 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 we're down and we've left a lot of money on the table, which I think may attribute to some of our financial issues. Okay. Who knows? Certainly enrollment and all of those things factor in, but there are other factors as well. Additionally, we have a fee structure and we started our fee structure and our revision for those that have been around 
uh, uh, some time back last year, and we'll continue that as we move forward with the budget for the next fiscal year. But those are items that I wanted to share with you. We also have our challenges with facilities, and we've done a lot with some of our um, uh, CARES Act money, some of the infrastructure, some of the boilers, some of the air handlers, some of the things like that. Dr. Kennedy was thanked and uh, the subcommittee on higher education Tuesday in Jefferson City, she and I and Steve Johnston were at the meeting and they were very complimentary, complimentary of how we had used our funds and we're thanking her for that. So we've made strides in that, but we're still moving ahead on that. Technology is the last challenge uh, for us on this campus. We're making strides, just want to point that out, but we're not quite where we need to be. When we had to make a shift to a lot of online learning environment things, it was a challenge for us in some areas. Thank you to the faculty. Thank you to the staff who made this work in our environment. Okay. Now I'll get off my soapbox for a moment <laughs> and I'll be happy to answer any question. But I just want to give you an update on things. Yes. Yes. Well, there, there, there are several things uh, we we can talk about. Uh, we we had to click in because of the pandemic. We had to shift quickly with a uh, procedure for crisis leave, things like that. That's one issue. We can talk about our committee structure, and Dr. Davenport's been leading a charge on some of those things, Bob, to where we have committee structure, university-wide committees that are not appropriate, probably served a purpose at one point in time, things like that. Well, we've, yeah, uh, our finance policies, we, we're looking at those particularly, and, and it deals with, uh, we can talk about, uh, you know, approvals for purchases and, and all those type things. They're just things that takes time to update and, and things like that. Okay. Anyone else? Thank you for your time. It, I promise you, it's all going to get better after I sit down. Okay. Thank. We are about 10 minutes ahead of schedule. Can we take a break? 10 minute break? Okay, we'll do that. We'll take a 10 minute break and resume at 1130. Thank you.
All right, we're gonna be live in about one second, fellas and ladies. Now we are live. Welcome back for our quick break. Uh, we are on to our next presentation. We will hear from our new general counsel, Ms. Kelly Douglas. Good morning, everyone. It's so wonderful to see you, to start to meet some of you, to continue to talk to others and work with you. Um, as Dr. Kennedy mentioned, when she says new general counsel, new general counsel, I started last week. So I am extremely uh, happy and grateful to be here and to work with the university and the board of governors and looking forward to getting to know each of you um, and helping in any way that I can. Um, so the topic that I'm going to present on today is an important topic. Um, and we're not, this is a short presentation. This is an overview, big picture. Um, I anticipate that probably as we work together and move forward, we'll speak to some of these same topic areas more frequently. Um, as well as work on other activities and issues together. Um, but for you and your role as Board of Governor members, it's very important that you understand some of the, the tenets of the role, some of the responsibilities, and some of the obligations that come with that role. So the first, sorry. <laughs> so the first is conflict of interest. Um, and a conflict of interest is generally defined, of course, as a conflict between the private interest and the official responsibilities of a person in a position of trust. And those are the positions that you are holding as members of the board, positions of trust. In Missouri, the conflict of interest laws are codified in chapter 105 of the Missouri Revised Statutes. Um, and the gist of that is that you are generally prohibited from personal financial gain um, in public, for public or officials that are appointed into those positions. Your spouses are also prohibited from personal financial gain as a result of your performance in this official role as are dependent children. In Missouri, the Missouri Ethics Commission has the responsibility for oversight and investigation of any potential uh, complaints or conflicts that may come to their attention. Um, at, when we talk about ethics, what we're essentially talking about and discussing are a member's fiduciary duty or responsibility to the institution. Uh, the concept of fiduciary is well established in law and practice, and it refers to one charged with acting beneficently on behalf of those whose welfare depends on the governing body. Each member of the board is expected to serve the public trust and to exercise duties and responsibilities solely in the interest of the public, the university, the board as a whole, and not in the member's own personal interest. Board members must realize that their, your fiduciary duty extends beyond ensuring just the fiscal health of the university, and it encompasses more than just avoiding conflict of interest in the institutions that you're serving. fiduciary responsibility, and what do each of these concepts entail? Fiduciary responsibilities are uh, sometimes given different terminology, sometimes there are different words that are used, but the, the four basic pillars, the tenets of each of these, what they embody are effectively the same. So for the duty of loyalty, this is a vision that requires a board member to put the interest of the board before all others. A conflicted board member obviously might be tempted to put personal interests first, but you always need to be acting in the interest of 
the Board of Governors as a whole, and the institution. There's a concept called the body corporate. Um, and that is basically a concept that individual governors on a board or individuals on a committee of a board do not have the authority to act in that capacity. Only the full board has the power to act and make those decisions. The duty of loyalty also encompasses the idea of promotion and support for the university and its relations with the public. And one last concept under this particular pillar is the idea of respecting and protecting the privileged and confidential information that you are able to access in the course of performing your official duties. To maintain that confidentiality about matters that are presented to the board at all times, unless you're otherwise directed or allowed under the laws in the state of Missouri to disclose that information or the policies of the institution to disclose that information otherwise. And one piece to remember with the confidentiality is in your capacity as a board of governors member, you are never not a member. And what I mean by that is whether you intend it or not, when you are out in the public and in the community and, and you are at a cocktail party talking to someone about, I heard the university intends, I thought the university said they might do this. When that is retold later, keep in mind that it may be retold as I heard the board of governor member say, this is what the institution intends to do. That may not be problematic in some instances, but just keep that in mind when you have your conversations, that information that you may only know in your official capacity that should not be disclosed remains undisclosed. The next idea is the duty of care. The duty of care requires full attention to one's duties, setting aside competing professional or personal interested so far as possible. Uh, Dr. Laney spoke to this this morning. Commit the time to be effective in the role. Attend board meetings, including your respective assigned committee meetings. The board functions most effectively and most efficiently when you are all present at the regularly scheduled meetings. It also functions most effectively and most efficiently when you come prepared bring your questions, have those discussions, ask for the data to support decision-making that helps you do your job. The next tenet is the duty of obedience. And this refers to the obligation to promote and support the mission of the university within ethical and legal limits. Hold to the university's mission and ensure the university is financially and operationally sound and stable. Ensure the university is acting at all times in accordance with its mission and purpose. The last pillar or tenet is the duty to act in good faith. And this is kind of an overarching, all encompassing concept. Um, it's less specific than some of the others, but the idea behind it is to exercise diligence, be competent, be objective, act with the appropriate diligence and the skill required under the circumstances. Protect the public's trust in effective education at this institution. Good governance. Make good governance of the university your first priority. Ensure transparency, responsiveness, equity, diversity, inclusiveness. Keep all of those concepts in the foreground when you make your decisions. Promote and support the university and its relations and preserve and achieve the university's vision, mission and values. 
respect. Respect fellow board members. Be the example of civility with each other. Engage in constructive discourse. There will be vigorous debates and disagreements, but be professional. Come to the meetings, come to your work with an approach of collaboration, cooperation, and teamwork. Integrity. Exercise sound moral judgment, act honestly, be self-aware, and be accountable, and hold each other accountable to those same standards. Fellowship. This is not a reference to the fellowship, the Lord of the Rings. This is, this is everyone in this room united in a common purpose. The purpose that we exist to transform the lives of our students and the communities that we serve. What an awesome, awesome vision we get to help achieve. We are united in that vision. Keep that vision in the foreground in all of your decision-making. The institution, its students, its employees, its staff come first. The last, fun, right? Okay, enjoy the work you do. We're all working together to make something good, great, better, best in this community for our students. Attend university events. Celebrate the success of the students. Celebrate the success of staff and faculty. Celebrate your own successes. Enjoy the moment. Okay. And that's all I had. I wanted to be brief. Um, but again, I just would say I'm so excited to be here. Um, and thank you very much for your time today and allowing me to share some information. Thank you. Kelly, before you, you take off, yeah. welcome. We're so happy to, to have you uh, on board. I have had the, the benefit of seeing your resume and your extensive background within higher education and, and uh, on the uh, various roles you have played in, in that, but maybe you could, uh, of I'm not trying to put you on the spot yeah. and make you off, we're talking about yourself, but uh, it, it's very impressive. And if you could just kind of elaborate on that a little bit to let the rest of the board know some of the expertise and experience that, that we're getting with you. Sure, of course, thank you. Um, attorneys love to talk about themselves. So uh, <laughs> prior to uh, starting this awesome position, I worked for the US Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights. Um, my last position I held there was as a supervisory attorney where I managed a team of other attorneys. Um, we worked across six different states um, with higher education institutions in all of those states to ensure compliance with federal civil rights laws. Um, so my background in that position at OCR, you know, the things we worked on, of course, were discrimination, harassment, accessibility. Um, accessibility in terms of physical accessibility on campuses, as well as program accessibility uh, for students with disabilities. Um, just a myriad of different topics that fall under the umbrella of harassment and discrimination in all different program aspects. Um, prior to working with the Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights, I worked in state government in Missouri and Jefferson City. Um, I worked for the Missouri Department of Social Services, um, and I did a lot of different things there during the time I was with the department. Um, most of it focused on employment law and working and overseeing a personnel unit and human resource group. Um, but it also, at one point, I was a director of a civil rights office within that agency as well. Um, and there again, managed investigations, worked on some affirmative action initiatives things of that matter. Um, before that, I went to law school um, and I went to the University of Missouri, Columbia, um, black and gold, so that was good. Didn't have to do a lot of changes with the wardrobe to come here, so that was great. Um, and I have um, a husband, his name is Nick, and I have a six-year-old daughter, her name is Evelyn. And so we are looking forward to joining the St. Jude, St. Joseph community and, and relocating and moving here and being part of your community. Fantastic. So, Welcome. Thank you.
Thanks. All right, thank you, Kelly. We're so happy to have her as part of our team. All right, next I'd like to introduce, needs no introduction, Mr. Steve Johnson, who will discuss uh, external relations with us, Steve. Thanks very much, Dr. Kennedy, and it's a good morning. It's a pleasure to be with each one of you. Um, I have had the uh, privilege of working with Missouri Western State University for approximately the last couple of years. It's kind of a, uh, a new arena for me, so to speak. I come from business and industry in terms of general background, but the, most of my background has been in collaborative work and in, uh, in both manufacturing and in uh, uh, community service. So external relations. External relations. So I've broken this down today into kind of four general categories. And that is advocacy on the local, on the regional, on the state, and then on the national level as well too. I view external relations as building and fostering relationships, uh, being connectors in the community throughout the state, and most importantly, collaboration. I feel like my top priority uh, in this particular role is building relationships. Building relationships, I'm a firm believer that that builds trust, and with trust, it builds strength and confidence and finally, relationships are always a two-way street. It's not just asking, but it's also sharing information and working closely and collaborative uh, with, other, with other organizations. I would also uh, preference my comments before we look into each one of those four areas that everything that I do is quite frankly a team approach with the university. Our cabinet uh, is very responsive to helping assist with strategies and, and ways to get from point A to point B to build opportunities, whether it's funding or grants or other opportunities that are available uh, at Missouri Western State University. So let's take a, uh, a look if we could on the local level and kind of how I look at this as, as and the university as well too. Most of you just uh, noticed that the Chamber publication came out recent, recently and it listed the top 10 employers in St. Joseph. And I'm pleased to announce that we're one of the top 10 employers. Quite frankly, the Chamber listed uh, 579 employees. We're not quite that strong now. We're back really back in the 400 area, but we are right at the top as a major employer in that community. And I think that uh, speaks highly for the university. We want to, uh, as a university, create a culture as a go-to organization or partner in the community in general. We wanna be thought of as having solid community engagement where we, have, we can use and share our expertise in a lot of different areas uh, that we have background in research and, uh, and folks who can, can assist. We also want to uh, expand partnerships and pipelines as we move through our, the process of building those relationships. Uh, business and community in, in workforce, for example. Workforce is extremely important. It happens to be the buzzword throughout the state, particularly in Jefferson City. We all need a solid, good workforce in order to build our programs, build our uh, various organizations. Um, those are things that uh, I think are extremely important uh, Missouri Western, if we um, apply for an exam, a grant, for example, we have to go through lots of different channels in order to do that, uh, from drafting to selling the concept and, and being at the forefront and leaders in those particular areas. Uh, the St. Joe School District, Hillier Technical Center, those are two areas that are extremely important for us as we expand opportunities and having good relationships with those and other schools not only in St. Joseph, but in the region are vital to, uh, vital to our process. The uh, local government area also includes organizations such as the 139th Airlift Wing. 
uh, a valuable community partner in St. Joseph and a growing partner in St. Joseph, Missouri. The city of St. Joseph, we wanna be engaged where we can providing expertise and input there as well, and also Buchanan County. I'm pleased to say that we have excellent relationships with all of those various groups. And we wanna work, continue to work in partnerships and build on those particular areas. The St. Joseph Community Survey. Every two years, the Community Alliance uh, since 2010 has done a community survey every other year. And so the last time that they did the survey was in 2018. One was not completed in 2020 because of COVID, but they will be moving forward with that particular uh, survey again in the spring of this year. And so that will be important. I thought I would share with you uh, an example of a question. So over the years, when we do cut surveys like this, if we ask the same question, we can monitor our progress in terms of, are we making headway? So this is one of four questions that we looked at uh, that I wanted to share with you today. Again, these are results are from 2018. So regarding Missouri Western, uh, by the way, this survey goes to 1800 residents in the, in the St. Joseph and Buchanan County area. It has a, um, it has a uh, uh, confidence level, if you will, of 3.9%. So the information that you see is, is valid information. Again, it's sent randomly uh, throughout the community. So as we look at those, uh, academic programs are of high quality. And you'll note that uh, in terms of the yellow, the yellow represents, uh, let me look here, uh, the yellow represents the 2016 survey. The blue represents the 2018 survey. So again, survey sent to North, South, East, West, Midtown, and St. Joseph. So it's a great cross section. So academic programs are of high quality. So 73% and 77% in terms of the comparison. So you see pretty similar results between that two year period when that particular survey was conducted. I'm familiar with Missouri Western's degree programs. Missouri Western students are prepared for careers upon graduation. So what I would like to share with you about the survey is uh, Missouri Western actually scored very high in most of these categories when we compare it with city services and some other areas. So we're very pleased about that. And again, these are monitoring opportunities that we have as a community with respect to our university. And the other three questions, I talked about a host of other things as well too. Okay, let's look at external relations then on a regional basis. Next week, for example, we have Great Northwest Days at the Capitol. That's a program that's been in place for about, uh, about 15 or 16 years now, where 19 counties in Northwest Missouri uh, participate in that particular function. This year it will be completely different because it'll be a virtual process as opposed to congregating in Jefferson City and meeting with legislators uh, and other uh, government elected officials. So it'll be a little bit differently. Uh, we also engage our student government association in Great Northwest Days at the Capitol as well too. But it's a great connector as we move forward and, and not only uh, expose Missouri Western to Northwest Missouri, but to other elected officials throughout the entire state. Great, a great program. The other things I've listed there too are all important uh, North, North Central business facilitation. We have folks on the university using their leadership skills to help with Northwest Missouri leadership, St. Joseph, or leadership of Northwest Missouri, and also leadership in, uh, in Savannah, Missouri. Okay, this is a really important category because as Daryl mentioned earlier, a big part of our funding comes from the state level. And so it's important that we, uh, we really focus on this and we do spend a lot of attention on the state level. Uh, this includes uh, contacts with uh, the governor and the lieutenant governor. I'm pleased to announce we've had both on campus very recently. We've had the governor here twice in the last, um, in the last three months. And I think that speaks highly for the university. The Lieutenant Governor has been here for programs like uh, 
the chief's training camp and other events as well too. So the House and the Senate are extremely important. Our local delegation is extremely important. We probably have the strongest delegation of local leaders going to Jefferson City than, we, than we've had in, in many, many years uh, because they have focused on key leadership positions. As an example, we have Representative Brenda Shields who serves on the Higher Education Committee, the subcommittee as vice chair, uh, we have uh, Rusty Black as an example from Chillicothe, Missouri, who, who chairs that. So Elizabeth has had the opportunity now to meet with all of these folks in the region and also in Jefferson City as well. And we continue to build on those things. Again, a very important area for us. Uh, we deal also with the Commissioner of Higher Education and Workforce Development, Zora Mulligan out of, Je out of Jefferson City, the Coordinating Board of Higher Education, also the Council of, uh, the coordinating board of the Council of Public Higher Education. So that's the organization of state uh, presidents, if you will. Those organizations have an executive director who also works as a liaison and advocate for us, if you will, for uh, all of higher education. Finally, we have the St. Joseph Legislative Partnership. And that, that partnership's been in existence for probably 15 years as well. That includes the chamber, the City of St. Joseph, Buchanan <laughs> County, Convention and Visitors Bureau, and also Missouri Western State University. So we pool together, if you will, as a community, uh, and Missouri Western is part of that as well too, in our efforts. I put COVID down, that's obviously a, a two-year process now that we've all, been, uh, we've all been working on. Obviously, we hope that that will come off the list here in the near future. All right, external relations on the national level. Uh, not a whole lot of things happen with higher education in in, on the national level in Washington, D.C. that they do in Jefferson City, but there are some very important pieces. Uh, Pell Grants, which are federally uh, grant subsidy programs. Senator Blunt uh, serves on the committee and continually continues, continues to get uh, increased funding for Pell Grants. And that helped students not only in St. Joseph, in the state of Missouri, uh, but throughout the United States. Broadband is important to all of us. We have students who uh, commute to Missouri Western State University, but on the home front, they have poor broadband reception or no broadband reception at all. Senator Blunt also plays a vital role in expanding broadband for us. Advocacy of elected officials. Uh, we've had Senator Blunt on campus We've tried to reach uh, out to uh, Senator Hawley. That hasn't happened yet. Congressman Graves, of course, uh, joins us on a pretty regular basis. Now that next item, the annual Washington DC fly-in, Bob and Connie, Wall Bob and Connie Wallman are very familiar with the Washington DC fly-in. So it is a uh, opportunity in a two day period to meet with a lot of elected officials. And Bob could tell you some great stories about the fly-in. And so I'm not going to talk about those today, Bob, because I don't want to embarrass you at all on a few things. <laughs> but the Washington DC fly-in is two packed days with elected officials and also various departments and organizations in Washington DC. So it's one that we focus, uh, focus on as well from, a, from an external relations standpoint. Okay, showcasing our campus. I mentioned the governor has been here twice. Uh, in, uh, in recent weeks, and so that's an advantage. I'm very pleased to report that at the state of the state message delivered by the governor on Wednesday, he singled out Missouri Western State University as, as well as a community college in the St. Louis area for their workforce development efforts. And that included very specifically the Moexcel grant. And many of you attended that particular event I think we have that highlighted over here as well. Uh, our nursing capacity has expanded by about 20% as a result of that MoExcel grant. We're working on other opportunities as well too. The second time the governor was here, it was for our military and uh, veterans uh, new center. And we received not only attention from the governor, but also the adjutant general of the state of Missouri as well. So with that in mind, those are some of the overviews as, we, as I've tried to define the area. 
again, local, regional, state, and on the national level. Again, I want to reinforce that it's always a team approach. I rely on everyone else's expertise. Uh, Dr. Kennedy has been kind enough to go to Jefferson City on a number of trips already in this legislative cycle. But prior to that, we developed relationships uh, in the fall of this year by going to see those elected officials. So questions that you may have in terms of external relations and the package that uh, we have available uh, to us in terms of lobbying efforts or advocacy. Steve, I don't have a question uh, per se, but I would like to, to make some comments. I, I could say it about every speaker with the appreciation of the expertise you bring, but there's certain uh, aspects I do want to highlight that, that uh, external relations was an underutilized uh, aspect, and now it is fully engaged uh, with uh, uh, President Kennedy and, and very much appreciate that one my regular communications with her when she's telling me what she's done and who she's been with and whatnot. And, and initially my, my uh, response was, how did you know so-and-so or how did you get that set up? And now I know the answer is always Steve Johnson did it. Steve Johnson did it. And so uh, I think the, the, the board just uh, needs to, to know and understand and appreciate uh, those relationships that you have been very modest about talking about, uh, it, getting her in in Jeff City and, and other places uh, is as well. You, you've carried a lot of water on that, and that is is an area that, that we appreciate and want to keep uh, supporting and uh, expand that to the extent possible. But Steve does so much stuff behind the scenes uh, in, in connecting us, and, and uh, we just need to be mindful. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. It's, I'm proud to serve the university and uh, Dr. Kennedy is always very receptive. I say, okay, I, I know it's an hour to Kansas City and back, but this is somebody we really got to connect with. And uh, so she's very receptive and open in her schedule to include these kind of things. Again, it's on the advocacy level, it's about building relationships, which builds that trust uh, so that we have uh, solid relationships when we, when we want to work together. Absolutely. Thank you. Anything else? Thank you all very much. Yes, I, I would just like to add, um, I'm also very grateful for Steve and his tutelage. I'm learning quite a bit from him and, and very responsive to that. Okay. So our second special guest uh, who will be joining us also for lunch today is one of our most valued philanthropist uh, members and an ardent supporter of all that is Missouri Western State University to whom we are most appreciative, Mr. Pete Gray. Uh, additionally, we want to acknowledge the importance of Gray manufacturing as an economic driver in our city, region, state. So, Pete will provide his perspectives as an industry leader uh, in terms of uh, how Gray Manufacturing views Missouri Western State University as a, con a contributor to their success. So before we invite Pete to come up, let me share just a little bit of Pete that you might not know. Pete Gray and his wife, Stacy are both natives of St. Joseph and both attended Central High School and Missouri Western State College. Married in October of 1993, they have three sons, Zachary, who is 24, Alec, who is 19, and Mitchell, who is 16. Pete serves as the third generation of Gray family ownership and leadership of Gray Manufacturing Company Incorporated. Starting in the business in 1989, Pete has held many different roles to include CEO since 2003. As CEO and an involved owner, he assures the continuity and consistency of the gray heritage that continues to make the customer successful. Pete and Stacy have also been actively involved in our local community. Stacy has been very involved in her children's schools, including the PTA, and she has served many years on the Pony Express Board of Directors. Pete has mentioned, mentored students at Edison Elementary School, served on the Missouri Western State uh, College Foundation Board, 
the Commerce Bank Regional Board, and the Noyes Home Community Board. Pete enjoys fishing, running, and most any outdoor activity. But most of all, he enjoys spending time and traveling with his family. Pete, would you please join me at the podium? Well, thank you, Dr. Kennedy, for that kind intro. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to speak with um, the Board of Governors and the Cabinet and any other faculty and staff that are here. Um, so again, thank you for this invitation. Can everyone hear me okay? Great. Well, I was asked for my perspective, you know, as it's related to the university's importance in providing a well-educated and skilled workforce in our region. And, you know, the importance of it, the obvious answer is it's highly important. Um, to Missouri Western's credit, I think that we do an outstanding job here. And I say we because I consider myself part of Missouri Western. Um, you know, the first way to look at it is there are so many successful alumni within our community that represent the quality of workforce that Missouri Western has and continues to provide. I can give a couple examples. Um, our own company, Gray Manufacturing, we have several people that have gone through the engineering technology program, and that has been a good partner for us. Um, we also have a young man that was a student athlete here he was a relief pitcher for the baseball team. He's still in his 20s, yet he heads our new product development team, which is a big job for us. Um, intellectual property is, is a big part of what we do, and he is already leading that team at a young age. We have three vice presidents. One of them is a finance major from Missouri Western, and he is our VP of Manufacturing Operations. He thought he wanted to be a finance major and do something along those lines. He had an internship at another company within St. Joe and decided that manufacturing was his thing. So when you provide his finance background of education with his experience in manufacturing, he's been invaluable for us. Our VP of sales and marketing is a business major from Missouri Western. And I believe he's a business management major. Um, he has really raised the bar for our organization. So I know that there are other examples and I can't name them all, but I will tell you on a personal level, my wife is a double major from Missouri Western in marketing and management. And my oldest son, Zach, recently graduated with a biochemistry degree from here. So that is just a representation of our family and our business. We are well represented within the community and that's a, a big kudos to Missouri Western. You know, in terms of partnering, Missouri Western does a very good job. If you look at the biggest industries within our community, I believe that you heard from Dr. Laney this morning, who help, you know, who heads our regional medical, um, <clears throat> our regional medical organization. And the partnering that Missouri Western does there, to my understanding, is through our nursing program which is one of our flagship programs as I understand it. That's a program and a relationship that we need to continue to foster and develop and grow. Again, big industry in St. Joe, animal life science. The sciences and the math programs here are another what I consider to be a flagship program. It was one of my dad's passions and he did everything he could to make sure that the technology and the equipment that was being used was state of the art. <clears throat> Again, another program that really needs to be nurtured and fostered and continued on. So I applaud Missouri Western um, in the partnerships that we have. There are certainly others that I can mention, um, but as you can imagine, one that's near and dear to my heart is manufacturing. And as I've indicated, we, we do partner with um, the 
engineering technology program, we tend to go more specific and say manufacturing engineering or process engineering. But um, before I get into that, I want to talk a little bit about manufacturing. In the last couple of weeks, I saw a video from the Chamber of Commerce. And I, I believe that you're on the Chamber of Commerce board, so you may have seen this as well, as well Dr. Kennedy, but it says that roughly one third of our region's workforce is manufacturing, one third. Now that may surprise some of you, it does not surprise me. 20 to 25 years ago, you know, we heard the stories and they were reality of offshoring. Lots of jobs were moving out of this country, primarily low skill jobs, but it was painful. We felt that effect here in St. Joe. A lot has changed since then. Supply chain challenges, cost structures, technology, and what we are seeing now in our industry is reshoring, meaning we are bringing jobs back to this country. And we are seeing it at a rate we've never seen before. I mentioned supply chain challenges. Many of our competitors use supply chain that is internationally sourced. We do not. And so during this time, they have had interruptions and shutdowns that we have not experienced. And the risk they run during that is not losing a customer base over a three month period or six month period until they get things back in order. It's the, the risk of losing your customer base permanently. So there are a lot of things working in favor for manufacturing coming back here. I, I guess to the point that it's, it's not how we used to talk about manufacturing isn't going anyway, anywhere. We're here to stay and we're here to grow. Several years ago, we were really challenged to find skilled labor. Um, at that time, I think roughly 1,000 jobs were unfilled in this community and six to 700 of them were manufacturing. Well, we felt that pain. We actually put together our own apprentice program, which is a, a story for another day. Um, but getting back to partnering with Western, engineering technology has been a solid program. We do have a couple of recent grads that are doing very, very well for us. So please take these comments, not as critical, but as opportunity. Um, to raise the bar perhaps <clears throat> for, for us as manufacturers, the kind of metal manufacturing that we do, that we are a little different than most of the programs in my opinion. There is a gap between high school and the university level that we need. Certainly the educational piece that we've received here at Western has been fantastic, but we need the hands-on piece. We need the classroom piece that goes along with that, that has come in the past in the form of many of our students while going here have worked in our shop floor throughout their four year degree. Um, they have sought classroom instruction. Typically in the past, that's come in the form of tech school. Um, more recently, we have partnered with North Central out of Trenton and they've supplied invaluable resources for us at the classroom level. And when I say that, excuse me, <clears throat> classroom instruction and in safety, quality, technical math, electricity, PLCs, industrial mechanics, and things of that like. I'm not suggesting that Missouri Western should get into welding or CNC machining or robotics or those types of courses, but it is part of what we as manufacturers need is the overall education component for our students and our incoming hires. And so is there a conversation that can be had? Is there some collaboration where we can do something different? We can look different than everyone else. We can be the model for which people strive to be to say, hey, they've figured out a way to collaborate with different educational institutions and raise the bar. That is, that is my ask today. Um, again, I, I, I applaud Missouri Western on so many levels. You know, one of the things that I, I look at, and I apologize my rambling, um, 
that it's easy to become focused on what you've been in the past and hope that that translates to future success. And while you don't want to abandon the past, you need to try to embrace change. And that's always easy to talk about. I'm probably the worst at it. It, it sounds really good until it's on my doorstep. Um, but I think Missouri Western's done a fantastic job of that. The, the, the program I look to when I say that is eSports. When I first heard of eSports, I, I, what is that? I love athletics. I, I follow sports. I love Missouri Western's athletic program right now. Um, MIAA is a fun brand of, of sports to watch, but um, eSports was explained to me and I was thinking, gee, it sounds like video games to me. You know, and so I started using Google, my friend, and understanding it a little more. And um, while I didn't get it, and I still don't quite get it, my kids do, and that generation certainly does. And it translates into big industry. I, in Googling, one of the things that really got my attention was a company called Activision Blizzard. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that name. If you haven't heard it, when you get home tonight, Google it. It's roughly, again, it's Activision Blizzard. They have roughly 10,000 employees, six and a half billion in annual revenue, and they're basically a video game holding company. What they, they have a couple names under their umbrella that you may be familiar with. I think Guitar Hero is one and Call of Duty is another. So again, these are things that I don't know and understand, but it sets us apart. It makes us different. It helps with enrollment. It helps with revenue. I'm, I love that Missouri Western is embracing those kinds of change. Again, another example for me is um, the Center for Service. It's here within our community, but where do we need the most support from within our community? And when we encourage kids to go out and seek an opportunity for service, they not only learn the importance of service, but they make contacts with the local community. They, they integrate in the community in a way that maybe we haven't before, because we do need to help continue to bridge the gap between the university and the community. And I think we've made great strides, but this should only help it even more. So um, again, I, I applaud the many, many things that Western's doing. I'm proud to be a part of it. I wanna help in any way I can. I will tell you in terms of partnering, our, our VP of sales and marketing I mentioned, he is on our foundation board currently um, for the manufacturing technology or engineering technology program. Our, uh, our engineer in charge of the manufacturing engineering program within our company is actually on the advisory committee to that. Um, and we are willing to help in any way we can with discussions regarding manufacturing opportunities, collaboration, and whatever it may be. But again, thank you all for the opportunity. I appreciate it. And um, I would be happy to take any questions. I don't know if I have the question, uh, Pete, but I'll, I'll be the, uh, the, the voice for uh, uh, appreciating you sharing your thoughts. <laughs> Uh, with us today, we we uh, appreciate uh, the exemplary uh, leadership that, that you and, and your family and your and your whole uh, business uh, are in the community and for the university. And I don't want to embarrass you because I, uh, I mean you you uh, uh, it could go on and on and on about that and how much we appreciate you. But but taking the time and, and giving your thoughts of how uh, you know. We can acknowledge our successes, but also keep evolving and growing, and and uh, and that's what what we want, and it helps us is is our community leaders uh, in our success story sharing uh, uh, their ideas with us, and and together we grow, together uh, we you know we we keep expanding upon that, and so we appreciate the servant leadership that, that you have demonstrated for us. And really you set an example for all of us that, that uh, try to, uh, to strive for. So thanks for taking the time and coming to talk to us and, and being such a, uh, a leader to our school and, 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 to, and to our community. We appreciate you more than, than we're able to, to, uh, to let you know. Well, I, I appreciate that. I, 
I try and tell everyone I know how much opportunity there is at Western, you know, whatever their level of interest, whether it's athletics or arts or sciences, there, there's so much, so many ways that they can get involved that are so rewarding. My time on the foundation board was very uh, healthy for me. Um, when you can see the way that you can impact young people's lives through scholarships and applied learning and um, going to symposiums and speaking engagements and things like that, that are the out of classroom um, learning experiences that they have to have that are so critical. So thank you, I appreciate the comments. Oh, yes, Al. People But I want to pick up on a point that she's going to close with, and that's collaboration with other educational institutions and how we work together in that process. And uh, that's a that's a very active topic on this board as we speak. And uh, you may get asked to participate a little more down the road here. I would welcome it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know it. it there are all kinds of challenges. I understand with that there's legislative challenges, there's all kinds of issues. My thinking is that we get the right people around the table and not burden ourselves with those restrictions and just say, let's talk about in a perfect world what this could look like and define that and then talk about now, how do we get there? Let's define where we wanna go, then carve out how we get there. And, you know, in a general sense, that's, that's my thinking. Um, and will it work? I don't know, but it's worth the discussion. It's worth the fight. I think we need to continue to look different and better than our other institutions around us. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, this is our break for lunch, which I believe they'll be serving in here to us, yes? And we will not be live or not not be live. Audio feed will be killed. So this will be a good time. Uh, we'll get lunch in. And uh, again, the facilities are down the hall to the left. Thank you.
All right, happy post-lunch session. Um, let me apologize in advance on your agenda. You have to deal with me of two of the next four presentations. So uh, my apologies there. This institution has quite a history of athletic directors serving as um, foundation directors or foundation directors serving as athletic directors. So about a decade ago, a man by the name of Dan Nickerson served as the AD here. Uh, he was the vice president of advancement and executive director of the foundation while Missouri Western was looking for an athletic director. And for this year thus far, um, I've been able to do it on the reverse. So in addition to the athletics duties, I've been able to serve in an interim role as vice president of advancement and the executive director of the foundation, um, at least for the next few months as we look at restructuring uh, a bit there and as we achieve some financial savings uh, with the merging of some positions. But I tell you, I've enjoyed it. It's been different, uh, but it's also similar. So I can see why those two roles um, here at Missouri Western and other places have been interchangeable. It's uh, wins, losses, uh, the, the, the critique and praise isn't as public over there, but it's the same of setting goals at the board and trying to exceed those. And when you do sustain that success. Um, so it, it's, been, it's been a lot of fun and, and it's, it's great working with um, our, our board on the foundation side. Steve Johnson mentioned external relations, it, hand in hand with everything he does. Uh, very few things uh, happen with the foundation that aren't touching external relations and vice versa. And so the foundation has been a great, uh, a great opportunity to see every uh, aspect of this institution. And those of you that have served on that board, um, one that currently does uh, know that as well. And so I, I'll give a, a brief uh, overview of the foundation, what I've learned, how we operate. And the first is really just the structure. There's three different models you will find in higher education of a foundation. And in fact, you'll see all three of these models at different schools within, I say our conference, the MIAA footprint, peer, public, regional higher education. You have fully dependent on institutional support. The foundation is part of the institution. You have fully independent, outside completely of the institution operates solely on its own resources and you have interdependent, which is partial. Anybody that is not, has not said one of those meetings want to guess which one we are with those. Interdependent. Interdependent. So it's a trick question because you would normally be right, but right now we're kind of in a quasi. So in most years we are interdependent, um, but right now it is somewhat fully independent from some of the things that uh, have occurred with the financial assistant, typically at interdependence, uh, some sharing of staff salaries, those types of things. The foundation has taken um, over the advancement wing for at least the next two years as part of uh, what that foundation has done as part of our financial recovery plan. So it is an interdependence. So you have the right answer, although right now we're kind of a, a quasi model. Uh, the foundation team, four individuals, uh, typically that is separate from the advancement team. That's another four individuals. That's been tough for me to conceptualize how that works because they all work together despite if for university employees, if for our foundation employees. But what, what encompasses that group is CFO, an independent CFO of the foundation, uh, database specialist, accountants, your fundraisers, your gift officers, uh, and your alumni relations. And so that encompasses advancement and the foundation. I like to think it is regardless if you're if you're a fully independent or an interdependent group, they all work together. They office together. Um, so it's really what's behind in the details. The structure, though, the foundation is a fully independent 501c3. In fact, uh, the foundation actually rents space in uh, Spratt Hall from this institution, pays the institution rent for for their space. Established in December of '68. Uh, but really there's an MOU that dates back to 2009 for that interdependent relationship that aligns exactly what the institution is responsible for and what the foundation is responsible for as you look at that, pro um, if you, as you look at that partnership. Really why is kind of the, the answer. Why is there a separate organization with a separate board, separate budget, separate audits that supports the institution. Uh, and there's several reasons for that, uh, regardless of which model. And first and foremost, you conduct this business much more effectively and efficiently than a state office. Um, different rules, different regulations. You can also fully separate state money from private money. Um, and for Daryl's area, making sure those don't 
become intertwined because there are separate rules and regulations on both of those. Another reason you can have more broad investments with higher returns. Uh, the risk that the institution does not have to take on with some of these, the foundation their board takes on. So they have more freedom uh, to accept different types of investments and to invest it differently than if you were to go through the institution and what the state would require. I would say that it's preferred by donors as well. Flexibility. Uh, if you give directly to the institution, which you can, a donor can do that, there's just less flexibility on what can be done with their contribution and what they'd like to see to push the university forward. So that's why the foundation is different and a different structure uh, than the institution. Responsibilities, you can see there's, there's a lot. Um, at the end of the day, I like to think of as long-term and short-term. There's the endowment, build the endowment, uh, build the restricted funds. But at the same time, there's the short-term approach, university initiatives, university needs, working with the university's president and their CFO. What are those short-term initiatives that need to go out and have campaigns for, while also continuing to build the long-term stability um, of restricted and endowment investments? Roles accepting and holding all gifts to the university. Um, and of course, there's the asset management, establishing asset allocation, distribution rates, all of those things that go through. Lots of transfers between the foundation and the institution. Daryl's team and the foundation's finance team work very closely together from scholarships to program funding uh, to immediate donations that go right to work to the longer term uh, distributions that go forward annually. Uh, some interesting flexibility with the foundation and investments. It, it, I, I went in thinking, okay, pr pretty simple, right? There's uh, individuals make up 80, 90% of the giving that comes into the foundation. Um, and it's probably a gift from a trust or a gift from a checking account or maybe their business. But the foundation has a number of different investments, oil wells and mineral rights, real estate, uh, live insurance, long-term notes. It's fascinating the different things that that board has been able to be creative in having their portfolio that ultimately all pays dividends out for the institution. Um, the foundation does have the right to use reasonable percentage of annual unrestricted funds and fees for services to support its operations. I'll, I'll give you a, a brief look at that here in a bit. But the board selection. So as I mentioned, two separate boards with the exception of two votes. University president sits on the foundation board and has a vote, Dr. Kenny does. And one of you, the board of governors has a vote. Right now, that is Lee. Um, we also have one of our newest board members, Bob Wallman, is currently the vice chair of the foundation. So he uh, will bring great experience and uh, looking forward to how the foundation is operated, but also how the board operates as well. Uh, those two groups, I think over the last two years, two plus years have grown even closer, the board and uh, the foundation, or at least knowledge of what each other um, are doing. And, you know, Bob, I'll, I'll probably ask you at the end of this to give some perspective just on, uh, on your time on the foundation board as well. But the board is made up of up to 32 members, about, about 20 some we're at, I think 26 or 27, uh, all community members, five alumni. I can serve up to nine years on that board, uh, three, three year terms and up to three years each. Bill Grimwood, a business leader at Hilliard is the current chair, Dennis Rizanki, business leader at Meyerhofer Funeral Homes is the vice chair. Uh, or sorry, the past chair. And then you have Bob Wolleman, Susan Pettigrew, and Pat Modlin making up that executive committee. Um, if you, The roster is in your board books. I think if you look through your board book, you will recognize a number of names and local business leaders that are invested in the foundation, in the success of the university. Um, and I would tell you it's a strong board uh, that uh, has a great passion for seeing Missouri Western continue to march forward. Committees, uh, there are six committees that do the work. Uh, all of these committees meet four times a year. The board meets four times a year. In fact, uh, we're going to be meeting in about two weeks. And, you know, I mentioned the, the goals and the numbers and athletics and how that's translated. The foundation team over there, as we set up at the beginning of this year, we said, all right, how do we engage, inspire optimism, challenge the status quo, 
and exceed the goals that the board has given us and last year's unrestricted giving despite all of the challenges of not hosting in-person community events, in-person donor events, the pandemic and its financial hardship it's caused on individuals and businesses. How do we get creative and not use that as an excuse for not meeting goals? And so the board gave that group goals and we're not there yet, but what you'll see, uh, Bob, in, in our foundation meeting is we're way ahead of where we were last year. And almost all of those unrestricted goals are close to 100%. And the foundation team over there, Chrissy McCann, Patty Long, Kim Weddle have done a tremendous job. And part of that was a Western League rally that a number of you were involved with um, that's been able to get people uh, re-engaged in talking about the institution. So very proud of the work they've done. Um, it's taking a lot of creativity and a lot of positive attitude in doing it uh, in this environment. Uh, but the foundation committees, separate audit, separate budget, separate development strategies, separate governance, and the brunt, I would say, of those committees is the investment committee that really dives into the institution's investments um, and almost, I would say, is a, a separate functioning board in some ways. Uh, they meet for several hours quarterly and uh, report out where our investments are to that board. And that is uh, the brunt of the foundation's investments are long-term with the investment committee. Here's what the investments look like. Really there's three, endowment restricted and unrestricted. 91% of the foundation's assets are in the first two. 88% of the foundation's assets are individual giving. Okay, so you have your endowment right now, it's paying out 4% of those endowed funds. One one and a half percent administrative fee. That is ultimately how the foundation, with its investments, can be independent at this time. Right. That goes back into funding those staff salaries that were and their operations that were jointly with the university up until last year. This investment committee has done a tremendous job. The endowment, the restricted assets. If you look in your book in the annual report ten years ago, um, when the foundation director was serving as the athletic director. The total assets were about 35 million in the foundation. Now uh, they closed at about 54 million last year. They're already over 55 this year. And for the first time in the university's history, over $6 million was given on an annual rate to support scholarships and programs. That's the most ever I could find is the most ever in the last decade. That's direct support that went straight to the institution uh, this last year. The foundation is strong right now. It has great leadership and it continues to grow. That's a great thing for this institution. Unrestricted giving though is the heartbeat of any institution, right? That is uh, what allows you to be flexible and nimble. Uh, and it is just 9% of the foundation right now. Uh, we've focused on how do we continue to get, uh, to expand our network with alumni uh, and others that are willing to give unrestricted gifts that can support the institution annually. Um, and that's about 9%. I mentioned the annual report, the full annual report is, is in your books and, and I gave you some highlights there. Um, I, I'd go back to just the growth and the ability to support the institution during the financial challenges it's had. Uh, the foundation and their leadership has played a key role and. Um, Governor Wollman's been uh, part of the foundation board for goodness. How are you? At, are you in your third term yet, or your second term? Second term. Um, I, you know, I, I, I cede the floor to you uh, to maybe give some thoughts on serving on that board um, when you came in as a community member, and just how how you've seen it benefit the institution that your new board members might find uh, interesting. And I started uh, participating in this, and we had 45 million, 46 million. We got up to 54, 55 million, and it's just it's just been a stunning journey. I know there was appeal by the board of governors and the president last year to help with some finance prop up, and we looked at a lot of 
unrestricted funds to make that happen and, and uh, we're able to do that and our balance is back above where it was prior to those transfers of money. Uh, I, I serve on the investment committee and I am a novice when it comes to that activity and the guys on that investment committee are stunning. We have people that are engaged in investment activity every day in their business lives and they come with reports when we start our committee that we ought to be doing this or we ought to be doing that. And I can, I can assure you the foundation and the uh, two investment groups, Commerce Bank and uh, U.S. Bank are our investment holders. It is U.S. Bank. Yes, U.S. Bank yep. are our holders on about an equal pairing. And it's always fun to see who yields on a quarterly basis the greatest returns. Who's, who's investing right? And then our balancing and our investments. We're very, very cautious about risk. Uh, we want enough risk that we have growth, but we don't want to... Uh, put at risk funds that would deteriorate this. So the foundation is uh, uh, a very high functioning group of people, very proud of what they're doing. And quite frankly, I'm humbled to be on that 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 group and the, and the investment committee because it's opened my eyes to how, uh, how great an asset it is to the university and, and to the generosity of our community. Oh, well, thank you. You've been a very valued member, and, I, and I'd echo the investment uh, committee and that group that's uh, the brunt of the investments for the institution. It is fascinating uh, to, to watch that group work and, and learn a lot as well. The, the next steps for the foundation right now and, and things that, that are on the radar outside of um, when we can get to a more normal schedule of events and alumni function is, is really the leadership of the foundation. And so, um, Dr. Kennedy and leadership in that board will be um, looking at timelines, what that looks like. And uh, so I'm happy to serve in this dual role at their pleasure uh, and, and, uh, and support that transition here uh, when that occurs uh, in the near future. So those are probably the things after the foundation. Any, any questions from anyone? No, okay. Thank you, Josh. Uh, next up, we have um, one of our other newest members to cabinet. You've met, um, been introduced to Dr. Mace, uh, but this will be her first time speaking to you. She is a, our new Vice President for Enrollment Management. So, Dr. Mace. All right, Governor Tiemann, President Kennedy, governors and colleagues, thank you. I'm excited to talk with you about um, enrollment management. Um, a lot of times folks think of enrollment management as just admissions, but we're, we actually look pretty holistically at admission, retention, and progress to graduation. And that's really our focus. Uh, in the enrollment management division, we have 34 professional and support staff members. So we have a pretty large team. We do have some openings right now, some of which we're working to fill. I think as a board, and I really embrace the words of Dr. Laney this morning, when you're thinking about oversight of the university, it's very important that you understand what's coming. So this is what is fondly or not so fondly referred to as the enrollment cliff. And as and so this is um, this is solid research based on population. And right now you will see we have a little pointer right here is where we are right now. So this light gray line is students who are in public high school, public schools. That's the dark line is public and private uh, K-12 education, and then the gap between the two. So we're really primarily going to draw from this population right here, which is the public institutions. 
And this is where we are. So when people talk about the enrollment cliff, it's not looming tomorrow, but it is coming. And so we have to do everything that we can do to prepare for that inevitability. So we're gonna see an increase in population over the next few years. And then it's gonna come back down to where we are now. And then we're gonna take a pretty sizable dip. And that's about a 17% dip, I believe. So. Um, so I wanted you to be aware of when we're building a strategic plan for the future, we're thinking about this. Now, this is just with traditional aged college students. So when we think about, we, we not only have to think about the freshman and transfer students, we also have to think about the non-traditional education of students. We have to think about high school students. We have to think about people wanting to come back later in life to change careers. And what we're going to do and how we're going to do it to meet the needs of our diverse populations. So how do we grow a diverse enrollment? So we have our traditional undergraduate, which is what you're gonna be most familiar with, right? Our, our traditional high school, community college, transfer students, rural, urban. Um, of course, we're gonna look at race and ethnicity, location, and do we look, do we look further into international? And then how do we support those? Scholarships. What's our tuition and fee structure? We heard Mr. Morrison talk about that earlier. And the programs and services we offer, the academic programs and the support services we have on campus. We talk about graduate education on campus, online, full-time, part-time, day, evening. All of that is something that we have to consider domestic and international again. Dual credit, dual enrollment, high school articulation agreements, and then non-traditional undergraduate, military, second career, non-degree seeking, looking at the modality, the flexibility, the price point, and the services we offer those folks. This is the recruitment funnel. And I thought it would be a good idea to take you through this. So this is on the admissions side. If uh, I'm imagining a, there are quite a few business folks in the room. So admissions is the sales team. Um, we are the ones who primarily sell the university, prospective students and their families are our customers. Um, I am very lucky in that we have great products from Dr. Davenport, great support from Mr. Morrison, um, great ancillary activities from Dr. Looney. We, we have marketing. So we, there's a lot of support that goes onto this so, or into this so, Enrollment management does not offer, op, operate in a silo. But I wanna take you through the funnel because over the next month, I'm going to give you projections of where I believe we will be. So it's important to know how I'm kind of coming to those conclusions. Leads at the top are purchased names. They didn't reach out to us, we bought their names. So. When high school students take the ACT and SAT, companies scoop up those names and they sell them to us and we buy them. We send out information to those students and we have a limited number of times to ethically reach out to them. If they do not engage by opening up our email, then we don't reach out to them again. Inquiries are names that where they have actually reached out to us, either by clicking on a link on our website and telling us they want more information, coming to um, meet us at a fair, uh, visiting us online. 
There are a wide variety of ways we engage with our inquiries. And then at that point, they start the application process. So an incomplete application is an application that has been started um, and submitted, but we don't have all the documents yet. A complete application is where we have all of, we have, we have their package, we're ready to make a decision. And then the accepts, we've made the decision. The go registrations, this is uh, orientation. So Griffin orientation, they register for orientation. That's an indicator that they have made a commitment to come to Missouri Western. We are well aware they can change their mind. Housing applications is another strong indicator. They've made a commitment. They wanna live on campus and then enrolled. Of course, we will never know the final number until they're in the classroom that first week of school, which is so important. But we work this funnel very hard, strategically, smartly, and diversely. We work it electronically through Slate, which is our customer relationship management system um, that we are still in the process of implementing, but it is good and strong and we are well on our way. So we, we send out information to prospective students and we engage with them and we engage with them. And as business people, you know that we have to continue to reach out, that it takes a minimum number of touches for us to be successful in drawing them into the university. When we get down here, we start to worry about summer melt. And summer melt is where it's just this lovely term that admissions folks somewhere along the way came up with. And that is they've applied, they've been accepted, maybe as early as November or December or earlier. And we have to continue to engage and communicate with them all the way up to that first day of classes so that they don't melt away. And that's a very important piece of our strategy. So we've engaged in a few new things to help with both the melt and the attraction to Missouri Western. And we will continue to build on those strategies. So we have um, Go Griffs which is a new webinar, live webinar. We run every Tuesday night. We send out an invitation to all of our students in our funnel on a variety of topics. So we have, we launched the series with how to complete an application, understanding scholarships and financial aid. Um, we did a student panel this week that was very well received. And now we're going to get into the academic programs. Let's see, I'm gonna go back here. So we're doing that. We're also of course doing the traditional fairs, school visits, both virtually and in person this spring, doing everything that we can possibly do to engage students. We'll have our um, showcases, we'll have, and then over the summer, we'll move into orientation. But recruitment is not the only thing. And recruitment is important, but so is retention. For every student we lose, we not only have to replace that student, we need to grow, we still need to grow another student. And we, need, we can do retention in a few different ways. Professional academic advisement is one of the areas um, under enrollment management. And if you're looking at the org chart, you'll see academic advisement. And then under academic advisement is the Center for Academic Support. So we want to make sure that students are appropriately advised. We want to make sure 
that if they need tutoring, that they can get tutoring. So we've recently expanded our tutoring hours. And then on Dr. Davenport's side, we want to make sure that there is exceptional student programming throughout the academic career. That is critical. So how do we, this is one of my questions, how do we leverage the first year experience, the freshman year, to increase the freshman retention rate that is currently sitting at 64.8% pre-COVID to over 70%. So what this means is our freshmen leave at a rate of 30, eight, 36%. That's, that's too much. So is orientation and Griffin Edge. How do we leverage University 101, a freshman course that focuses on academic success in and out of the classroom? Do we look at centralized academic advising for all freshmen? What is the co-curricular engagement through student activities? And how do we prepare our students for graduation from the first day? That's important because we all know that getting a bachelor's degree is a long road and you have to be able to visualize the end of that road to get there. Oops, sorry. So these are some of the things that I wanted to talk about today. And um, in your packet, you have, you have the org chart for enrollment management. But you also have the definition of enrollment management. There are two. The first one is um, the definition that a, a lot of schools embrace. The one below it is one that I wrote because it's one that I feel pretty strongly about. And with that, I would be happy to entertain questions. Thank you very much. Actually, oh. I'm, I'm sorry, I was looking for your chart there. I wanted yeah. to ask you a couple of things. I appreciate the, the presentation. Um, and I know you haven't been here that terribly long yet, so. Uh, if any of my, my questions are, are unfair, I, I apologize and just tell me a little more, more time with that. Has there been a, uh, obviously our bread and butter has been St. Joe kids. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. you know, majority of kids coming here. Sure. We're all aware that there's declining population mm -hmm. in St. Joseph and McKinney County and, and uh, the public school enrollment is down. And so, uh, creates uh, an additional challenge in your from your perspective have you do you believe there's an appropriate footprint that we would expand or how far can we go uh, for our strong recruitment obviously we will we will take the appropriate uh, you know applicants from anywhere mm -hmm. you know, I mean that that's obvious but we can't have boots on the ground at every high school in the state, in the region, whatever. Well, we are going to do our best to have boots on the ground in every high school in the state. Well, I'll tell you that. <laughs> but, but at some point, we have to emphasize certain areas. We I'm do. wondering where that, you know, we have a, uh, what the state defines as our service territory mm -hmm. you know, as a university, the various counties. Uh, but where do you see that expanding to? I mean, what part of, how much of Kansas City is an appropriate target for us? how much into the rural areas uh, is becomes an appropriate target and an effective target for us going forward? Mm -hmm. Well, that, that is a fantastic question. If I were to, if I had a marker and a whiteboard, I would probably draw a picture of St. Joe as a dot. And then I would do a rather uh, large radius around St. Joe and thinking about where we can be most effective. So we're an open enrollment institution. So we're going to think about primarily the public school students who may be attracted to this area 
and then um, and, and they're going to be our primary market. So, so into Kansas City, we're going to go up. We'll we'll cut through part of Iowa and Nebraska and around into Kansas, and that's going to be really our primary. We're going to attack that group with, let's say, tier one recruitment efforts on the ground plus, so tier one is on the ground, face-to-face -face as much as possible, and then every, all the other supports that I'll talk about. Then from there, we'll draw another circle out and we'll look at tier two. So we can't do face-to-face -face with that necessarily, or it'll be pretty limited because of resources, but we'll look at how do we use Slate? How do we use our customer relationship management system? How do we use Zoom? We're getting very good at virtual relationships. So how do we use those? Um, and, and we'll do that. How do we use our mailings? Who do we want to send our mailings to? Because we have a limited number of, of those as well. And we're going to really at, at, attack it that way. Now, if we decided we wanted to go further, we would really get into demographics then. We would look at this, the, the makeup of the successful student here and we would find and where they're from. So if they're from Buchanan County or Andrews or another county, then there are matching counties all throughout the United States. We would buy names in those areas and start to um, do a campaign there. So that's really how we would attract students. As we do start to decline, we will have to look at that more and more. Did I answer your question? No, it, it does, and anybody, I, I welcome others to jump in. I've just got a few uh, follow-ups with that. Mm -hmm. Could you explain to us about the buying of names? I mean, I know you sure. had uh, you know, indicated it's, it's you know, getting the information of kids that's mm -hmm. taken the ACT and, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. uh, we have just been through as an institution uh, having outside source do recruitment for us. And so yes. Things, and I don't I want to make sure we understand the distinction of what you're doing, yes. what you're talking about compared to what we had had done in the past that we have now gotten away from. Right. And so EAB was the company that um, Missouri Western outsourced pretty much nearly all of recruitment too. And what EAB does is it front loads your funnel. Okay. So if you were to Google, I want to go to college, there would be different, or I want to study business. There would be different search engines that would pop up or different, different websites would pop up. Maybe it's hot courses. Maybe it's um, study in the USA. Maybe it's something else. But some of those searches are owned by pretty big companies and they're collecting all that data. And then that's just an inquiry. It doesn't mean that they're necessarily interested in Missouri Western. It means they're interested in going to college, maybe in the Midwest, and maybe they're a decent match for Missouri Western. Well, EAB pushed all of those inquiries and applications into our funnel. So they, they front loaded our funnel with, with students who are not necessarily interested in going to Missouri Western. This caused a ton of operations work. It's caused a ton of uh, admissions work on the back end and a very low yield rate. So a yield rate of about 13%. It skewed our funnel to the point where I can't really consider the last five years. I have to go back further when I'm creating projections. Um, name buying is completely separate. When students take the ACT, uh, SAT, or something different, they check a box that says, yes, I want information about colleges. 
and we buy those names. We go in, we have a couple of different companies with whom we work. And we say, we're looking for this student with this range of ACT score who lives in this area. And they, and, and then we buy those names. And we usually do a contract for the year and we buy, you know, so many, but it ranges from 20 to 33 cents a name, something along those lines. Completely different because then we put those in, those names in as leads and we ourselves work the funnel. We don't rely on a third party company. We do it ourselves. And Slate has been instrumental in helping us do that. So we send those students emails. We send them invitations to Go Griffs Weekly. We send them information about applications. Uh, and, and we work the funnel, we answer their questions and we convert them to admits. Um, that, that's the big difference is they're not just dumped into our system. Now we bought about 84,000 names this year. Um, we, we made a huge purchase and we're working very hard to convert those. So, yes, ma'am. typical conversion in the university world? I mean uh, typically we would see a conversion of, we would see a 33%, 29 to 33% is what we're gonna see, depending. Now, it's not on the leads and inquiries, it's the accepts okay, so to enroll. From the top down, you know? Well, it depends on how much you get in there, but it's gonna be pretty narrow. So it's gonna be pretty thin. Um, but the, the, the yield rate is really when we're talking about this down here. And that's and, and that's that twenty nine to thirty three percent. I'm on I'm erring on the side of caution and saying twenty nine percent as my yield rate. Yeah, but I think we got to know higher than that, right? If it's really a funnel. So well, we I can think. yeah, we can put the numbers up there. I wouldn't want to give you that number off the top of my head. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I just thought maybe in in my business, I mean, it's a known number, like what percent right. most companies get in our industry to the Sure. Yeah. So I, I just thought maybe that was a known number. And you what know. I have to do, though, is I have to go back to 2015, 14, and earlier. I cannot look at the last yeah. Um five years. I, I think another piece in this, which makes a little different is it depends on when you talk about yield rates across institutions, what kind of institution are you? If you're highly selective, you're going to have a huge yield rate, right? Because everybody wants to go there, right? If you're open access and you're trying to get as many students in, that's going to make a difference too. Typically across any kind of institution that uses EAB or some company like that, the yield rates are always very low because they're just throwing anybody they can yeah, get to name to. They are low. So that's yeah. why I mean, and I mm -hmm. think you, it's helpful to know that so you don't create an expectation that, yes. you know, it's going to make you feel like a failure because you're not. Exactly. Right. right. Yep. Yeah. And Governor Norton, I'll have that information for you. Any other questions? Yes, sir. You say our retention rate now is approximately 65% and you'd like to move it to 70. Wondering why 70 and not 68 percent or 80 or some other number. So our, sure, our overall retention rate is about 75 percent right now. So I would like to. It's not going to happen in one year, obviously. That's just the first benchmark is pushing it toward that 70 percent. That will also push up that 75 percent on the overall rate. And so eventually, yes, we want a very healthy retention rate, but it is in this case going to be baby steps. And that's, I mean, we get put in, and I'm just more of a comment, the unfair position of that. I mean, we are the mandated open access mm -hmm. institution, which is fine. And, and I welcome that mission and that serves an incredible role. But then when that gets used against us, whether it be in state funding or by peer institutions that say, oh, a higher percentage stay there. Well, we're, mm -hmm. we're serving different missions. We are. So that's, I guess, the comment part. But do we see how that changes within 
any demographics, like the freshman retention rate is higher than that for local kids, or it's lower than that for local kids, or it's uh, if you live on campus, it's higher, and if you live off campus, it's lower, or... I will, I will tell you, I can't answer part of that question. And that is, we know that if a student lives on campus, they're more likely to be retained and be successful than a freshman who lives off campus. And if I could give just a little perspective too, um, because when I came to the university, I came as a role of vice provost. And my, you know, I started in January and we were looking at the spring enrollment, which was a year ago. And I, it caught my eye that our freshmen were class we were losing a third of them. And that's when I realized that we really had to start to hit the ground and do some, when you think about the policies and whatnot, which is why we have this cabinet level position to really focus on that. FYE, the first year experience is going to be critical in terms of what we do to increase retention. Because if you keep a freshman to a sophomore, you'll keep them to a junior, you'll keep them to a senior. And that's why one of the things I've tasked Melissa to do is to develop a first year experience program specifically dedicated to our freshmen coming in, whether they live on campus or they live at home, mm -hmm. but to create a cross campus program that's designed to support them, keep them engaged and keep them retained. So. So Melissa is jumping in on all levels. Um, and then one other thing, kind of to your question, Lee, one of the things that Melissa has brought to me is some data about exactly where our students are coming from. You know, how many are coming from St. Charles? How many are coming from St. Louis, Kansas City? What did it look like 15, 16, 17, 18, all the way through? Because that's how we get at those predictor models. And that's how we figure out who's going to come and how do we get them here, so. Yes, yes sir. <laughs> Kevin Orlandis. <laughs> Being honored again. You know, we all Google around every once in a while. So I Googled Missouri colleges and it pulled them all up. And one thing that surprised me, they showed the average cost after age at each one of the universities. They showed the graduation rate. And then in a lot of respects, they had the acceptance rate. Well, I, I wanted to go find, obviously, ourselves, and I went to find somebody that was very similar to us. So it shows our average cost at $11,000. Uh, Missouri Western, or excuse me, that's a Northwest $12,000, Truman State $12,000. It showed our graduation rate at 29%, showed Northwest at 49% and Truman at 72. So if I was coming in here and I was looking through colleges, that 92% wouldn't be real impressive to me in a lot of ways. Now I'm not saying any of that is accurate, <clears throat> but my question is more and more as we've got into, we're associating ourselves and talking to our peers at number at other universities. And my question is, if these are right, why are we only graduating 29% with Northwest, you know, for the same money, Northwest of 49 and Truman at 72? That's a fantastic question. I, I can help. <laughs> Please. <laughs> so, so I would, I would I'd want to check the numbers for the tuition. I don't know that we're that close to Northwest, but graduation rate goes back to selectivity, right? When you take, we're open access. We yeah. will take any student coming in and think about it too, because that has a big impact on the resources that we need. For us to take in a student who's less academically prepared than someone who's going to go to Truman State, I can guarantee you that, right? Um, we have to spend more of our resources, more of our time and more of our energy to get them up to speed. And that's the population where without proper support inside and outside the classroom, they are much less likely to graduate. Now we can do better than 29%, but that's the key factor. And again, that's why we have to get that first year experience program built across campus, across the university, and why we have to collaborate with our K through 12 partners to make sure we're building those pipelines, whether it's the early college program, 
or whether it's just what we can do to go in, so provide support to the K through 12 students and make sure that they're college ready when they get here. Mm -hmm. It's a pretty, if you look at institutions across the country and you look at selectivity and who's open versus top, like a Harvard or something like that, you see as selectivity goes up, so does graduation rate. It's just a function of that. Okay, I got one more. Dr. Jones is, is gonna react to this one because I'm a past president of the Associated General Contractors of America representing 25,000 contractors in all 50 states, including Puerto Rico. We have an education and research foundation that's full mission is to give scholarships for people that are going in to the construction industry. Likewise, I'm a past president of Beavers, which Dr. Jones knows about. You go, who in the hell are the Beavers? Well, the Beavers are the biggest heavy civil contractors in the United States. They have a foundation. And when I was president of it, one of the things I could do is I could give $100,000 to any colleague that I wanted to. Well, guess who got it right here? They continue to give scholarships. <clears throat> One of my frustrations in that, and I am tickled to death that you are here. Thank you, me too. Because, well, <laughs> and here's the reason why. When I tried to go find out where, here, anybody that graduated from any, uh, engineering technology, I said, who hired them and where did they go? Nobody could even remotely here tell that. There's a reason why anybody graduating from here, they go out in here, you know, when we want to seek money for the foundation or whatever else, you go to the alum alumni that come out of here. What I understood, we weren't even capable of doing that because we didn't know where they went and where they were anymore. So my point, thank you for being here. Uh, and thank you for your responses. But, uh, I just thought I'd share that with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any additional questions? Thank you. All righty. Now in a completely different role, <laughs> I'd like to invite Doug Davenport up again to do uh, student affairs. I will be, begin by extending my deepest condolences to those of you who heard me previously and now are stuck with me for a second time after lunch. This is cruel and unusual punishment. Bob, you, Governor, Governor Wallerman, please, uh, you know, not so enthusiastic with the agreement on that statement, but uh, I, I, I would just like to take uh, one or two one or two moments just to follow up with the conversation because um, I appreciate Dr. Mace's arrival at our campus and I'm excited to work with her in various capacities. This issue of student success and graduation rates is clearly one of those long-term goals that because when, when students succeed, we all succeed. And um, it was my pleasure actually to work for almost 20 years at Truman State University where uh, as, a, as a dean, several of us noted, uh, we are doomed to success because when you have highly capable students who come in, you basically get out of their way and they will graduate. Uh, however, I will say as Governor Wolleman and I were talking about just a, a, a bit earlier today, our status as an open enrollment institution is vital. I am proud that we serve as one of three in our state and the other two are historically black colleges and universities, H HBCUs with very different missions than ours. We serve many students from all across the state uh, who have no other viable options for a quality university education. So. It is, it is a challenge that we face and I'm, I'm excited that we are going to continue to improve the outcomes for our students. 
So let me move now and put on a different hat and talk for just a few minutes about the Division of Student Affairs, which it has been uh, my pleasure to serve as their, their primary cabinet uh, representative and leader over the past fiscal year, so the last several months. And it has been a learning curve for me. Uh, I've appreciated from a distance the work of Student Affairs and, uh, and I'm very grateful for what they do. And so I have had to learn uh, a lot about their activities, their responsibilities. And so I'm gonna try to give you a brief overview in a few minutes of what they do. And as you know, student affairs and academic affairs go hand in hand. It's, at many institutions, there's this notion that somehow they are just these separate silos and they really don't engage with each other. And I think it's important to note that at Missouri Western, and again, back to our status as an open access institution, the alignment, collaboration, and working together on the part of academic and student affairs is even more crucial because we are serving students, not simply their minds, but we are serving the whole student. And as we all know, students come to us not simply to receive uh, content knowledge, but they come to grow as persons. And it is our task and our responsibility to serve them in that capacity to the very best of our ability. I will give you, as I begin, just a, this is the statement of the mission and the, and the role of student affairs and it's guiding students really as they develop the values of civility, respect, and character while also fostering self-awareness, global citizenship, and social responsibility. So those are all things that the classroom has an important role to play, but there's all those other experiences and activities that we are, we are expected to provide so that students leave the, the university as representatives of Missouri Western, but more importantly, as educated citizens of the United States in the state of Missouri. So student affairs plays a key role in doing that. And I am grateful to work with some wonderful colleagues uh, who are all primarily in the Blum Union in terms of their location, though not all of them are. I wanted to just present with to you a, the, the, the key individuals who are at the director level or above. And there's, there's not very many. So one of the things you will note is we are a pretty lean operation in student affairs. And uh, so this is, this is the current leadership team. I'm so grateful that I get to work with Dr. Hannah Piosky, who is the Associate Vice President and Dean of Students. And she is, uh, she is actually a fairly recent addition to our team. And uh, it has been my pleasure to work with her directly. And we have lots and lots of things that we talk about on a regular basis. One of the things that has happened since I stepped into this role as a VP with a student affairs responsibility is that we are trying to manage the day-to-day -day operations in the face of a pandemic. It would be, I think, much different if we did not have that that was on our plate. And so this is a complicated role anyway, but these folks are endeavoring to uh, create success for our students in the face of some pretty challenging circumstances. Uh, Justin McMillan is, an, is, an, is a recent addition to our leadership team as student development director. Latoya Muhammad has been here for a number of years. She has been leading the Center for Multicultural Education for, for several years and uh, she's a, a great colleague. Uh, Megan Rainey is a fairly recent addition as the Career Development Center Director. And then Josh Maples, who was the Assistant uh, Director of Residence Life, has, been, has stepped up and he is now the, the uh, Director. And what you will notice in the midst of this is this team is largely new. And, and so there's a learning curve for them to understand who we are and for us to understand who they are and how to best use their strengths. But they are building a team. And of course, they're behind the scenes for most of our students, they are front and center. That is the residence life, uh, the hall directors, the RAs, all of the, all of the student assistants. Then we have a number of people that work in, in various areas. So I thought I would show you 
the set of responsibilities that fall under student affairs at this point. Obviously, residence life, which is connected to housing and residence life. Uh, there's also career development. We mentioned that student development, multicultural education. Then we have counseling services, which in the face of the pandemic, the student mental health needs have increased dramatically. Now, many of them do not seek help and that is part of the problem. And so it is our job to encourage them to seek help wherever they can to provide the support that we can. And uh, that's a daunting task, but uh, we have counseling services that's a part of that. The Esri Health Center, the Student Health Center, that has been integral as we have responded to COVID. They, they have become very involved and not just for students. This has been a part of the challenge that we're serving the entire campus community in light of COVID and they have been playing a role in that as well and health and wellness more generally, programming that relates to student health, mental and otherwise activities, student government association, of course. And, and I think that one of the things that we, we forget is that our students are, are very engaged in, in trying to be leaders on our campus in many ways, and student government is crucial to that role. And so they actually, uh, take responsibility for a tremendous amount of programming. We do have a lot of student organizations, recognized student organizations on our campus. And so SGA is vital to what we do here. The Accessibility Resource Center, students who have disabilities that come forward, they need accommodations. We need to serve them. And so Mike Ritter serves as a director for that, along with the non-traditional and commuter student center. It is my... Uh, it is my expectation that over the next few years, what we now call the non-traditional student will become most likely the majority student on our campus because of, as Dr. Mace has pointed out, the enrollment cliff. So if, you, if you're only seeking out those first year full-time freshman students and, and all of their students are essentially not included, then, then that's, that's a problem. And we have a strong, uh, number of students who are what we now call non-traditional or um, and, and various various other terms are used to refer to those students. But here's the thing, they are adult learners who want to come to college in various ways. Some are seeking degrees, others are not, but we are here to serve them as well. And that non-traditional and commuter student center is, is a, is a uh, a part of that service. And then the Griffin Testing Center as we do accommodated testing for those who have various needs. So this is a this is a broad overview and there's a lot more that I could talk about. But again, I, I don't wanna take a, a, a lot of time, but I want you to have just a bit of an understanding of these are the functions that they carry out on a regular basis. So I asked the Dean of Students, I said, Hannah, help me to provide just a little slice of what it's like. What are we doing in student affairs right now? Because it's easy to think, well, it's just the residence halls and dining and that's all that really goes on. That is really not the case. So I've provided just a list and actually Dr. Piaski has provided that list, but they have been very clearly and, and, and in a major way involved in our COVID response tracing, contact tracing and support. We are also looking at changing our, what is known as a behavioral intervention team to provide much more of a safety support, safety net support network for students who are experiencing problems of various sorts, whether it be academic or whether it be social, financial, uh, whatever the need is. And so thinking about how might we revamp this because that all will connect to student support. And again, if we're going to advance the completion rates, graduation rates of our students, this is the kind of thing that's a key piece to that. And that Dr. Mace had mentioned that, that student support piece, this is part of what we're looking at there. We also provide emergency scholarships and my thanks to the foundation because they provide funding for some emergency scholarships. And I see every one of those applications as they come through. They tell us some very um, 
challenging stories of why they need help. They've lost their job. They have a family member that, that is no longer able to provide support. They can't pay their bills. And, and so we serve many students who are on the margins financially. The emergency scholarship is able to help get them through so they can complete a semester. We're grateful for that opportunity. CARES Act allocations, of course, we provide funding to the students. That's been part of our, our, our use of those monies. And it is, it is a wonderful way in which we can support our students because for many of our students, the issue is, I can't afford to go to college. Can you help me? And we're glad that we can say, yes, we can. And we wish we could say yes in more ways and to more students. But again, that is, uh, that is part of our challenge. The uh, Esri Health uh, Student Center, Health Center has also been involved with our, our testing uh, for COVID. And that's been a wonderful thing that they have done. We will have a new uh, uh, sorority on our campus this spring. This is one of the historically black sororities. And so we're grateful that they are coming on board this, this spring. They have been involved, Student Affairs has been very involved in assisting with getting votes, getting students to engage and become voters and become good citizens contributing to our democracy. And finally, I would just note that we've had a number of things regarding the student community recognition that we, we do on, on an annual basis. The uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Drum Major for Justice Award is to uh, a student and a, a faculty or staff and to a community member. That's always a wonderful highlight to recognize those individuals who are serving uh, in our community in very important ways. Uh, recognizing students and organizations. We, we actually began this a couple of years ago. Of course, in the COVID world, we can't have the kind of event that we had uh, three years ago where we had several hundred people in the room talking about all of the things that are going on through student activities that are supporting our community. And finally, uh, we, we're doing an RA, or that's a residence assistance uh, appreciation day on a Friday, February 5th. So one of the gold Friday activities for our student affairs folks. So with that, let me back up here. I will, I will stop. I, <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> I am, I'm happy to answer, answer questions as best as I can with regard to student affairs. Thank you. Guess who's next? <laughs> All right, Dr. Looney, come in and uh, talk about athletics for us, if you would, please. All right, thank you. We'll now dive into intercollegiate athletics, recreation services, and esports. Uh, this is my fourth year at Missouri Western, uh, three and a half actual years. The second two did not exist under athletics uh, when I got here or until this year. And so we'll talk a lot about expansion of athletics and why those three areas that break down that, that are in the in athletics, but are in each of their three separate areas here. Intercollegiate athletics, that's your 17 NCAA sponsored sports. Recreation services, club sports, intramurals, the pool, the fitness center, open rec space in the Looney complex. Uh, for those uh, new board members, no relation. Looney's a, not a real common last name, but apparently it is at Missouri Western. So, um, And then esports, uh, which is esports competes. Um, we may even be in a Division II conference at some point, uh, but it is separate from the NCAA sports and has to be kept separate, uh, at least for the time being. Uh, NCAA is not recognized sponsor. There's all sorts of uh, name, image, likeness, uh, lit litigation going on, and uh, there's prize money involved. And so esports is under athletics, but very separate from NCAA. So just to, to you know, the, the athletics piece and esports are probably the things that get the most attention in here. I, I'll give an opinion that you didn't ask for, though, with uh, things that. Dr. Mace has, has given an overview with, as well as Dr. Davenport. Rec services is critical uh, on this campus moving forward. Um, we have a great director there in Emily Ludwig, but we need to grow that area in the engagement and opportunities um, 
and strategically moving forward. It's, it's a critical step. Um, and I hate to say something's more important than athletics because that's what got me here, but that is a major, major focus and needs to be um, in the next several years for a number of reasons. So, uh, and we're fortunate that we have a very good director there. So talking about the expansion of Griffin Athletics, it, it is uh, last year, 16 sports. I increased from just 10 sports four years ago. We're at 10. We're adding our 17th that will uh, start later this month. We've also absorbed leadership of the Mystics dance team. Esports has been launched and then recreation services, as I mentioned. So when you look at that expansion, I'll give you some numbers. I think the first question, particularly on the athletic side is, is why in a time of financial struggle, why in the world is athletics growing at Missouri Western at the division two level? You look around division three schools are adding some sports and the ice schools are adding sports. Meanwhile, the headlines, Minnesota drops handful of sports. University of Iowa eliminates sports. Stanford drops 15 sports. I'll try and answer some of that. The economics are totally different. Um, and really it comes down to a few things. Enrollment, retention, graduation, ROI. It's that simple. So hopefully some of these slides will give some perspective there on how the Division II model works and how we work uh, on the athletics at Missouri Western. Here's what we look like the past decade. Pretty impressive growth, 55% uh, from 2010 to present, 44% growth from four years ago. This is the student athlete count on campus. So in 2010, you had 283 student athletes at Missouri Western. You have 440 right now. That does not include esports. That does not include the Mystics dance team. So I guess you'd probably say it's about 500 plus. Um, that is just your NCAA captured athletes. Um, track and field was added in 1718. That's why you saw the big jump in from 1617 to 1718. That's your sixth sport edition. Men's and women's side on the cross country, men's and women's on indoor, men's and women's on outdoor. It's about a hundred, a little less than a hundred student athletes were added uh, there. When you look at housing, uh, I'll be frank, we, we look a lot more like a private school than a public school when our on-campus housing. Uh, I don't know what, what the numbers are for this year, from this fall uh, or this spring, but in 1920, we had grown to nearly 30% of our on-campus living or student athletes. Um, so it, it's, it's grown with the enrollment. Um, so why, how does the division two model work? What is different between Mizzou and Missouri Western besides the obvious? Well, the first is the partial scholarship model. Very few, Division II athletes at Missouri Western or any Division II institution are on full ride scholarships. Depending on the sport at Mizzou and KU and K-State, very few Division I athletes are not on a full ride scholarship or a cost of attendance where they're actually being paid in addition to not paying for school um, for their incidentals. Cost Division II school is about half as much to sponsor competitive athletics as it does Division I FCS program. FCS would be Southeast Missouri State, right? A little bit larger school not in Mizzou, they play FCS football, they have access to the Division I basketball tournament. Average, all in, and you count scholarship money, salaries, um, and expenses is about double what a Division II program would be. We operate like an FCS program. Our facilities are like an FCS program. We recruit against FCS schools. We think of ourselves as an FCS program, but because of partial scholarship model and because we don't fly anywhere, we take buses, through a four state area, almost exclusively, the expenses for athletics are much different than it is at the division one level. Life in the balance is the other thing, getting athletes involved in high level competition, but something that extends beyond just that. We measure our programs in three areas. Our coaches could tell you, it's on their evaluation, classroom competition, community, C classroom competition and community. Competition, throw that out. We know what that looks like, right? At the end of the day, it's wins and losses. Every program is a different spot. Classroom, we are measuring what's the team GPA, how many are on academic honor list, how many are you graduating out of potential graduates. There's a goal and there's an expectation. Expectation is the minimum. Goal is what gets a higher rating. Community, how involved are you? It's not service, it's engagement. Bringing people back to this campus. Do our donors and alumni know you as a coach? They know your student athletes. They have hour marks, service marks that they must do. It's typically pre-COVID. 
uh, 10 hours per student athlete on each team. So 17 person basketball team, that's uh, what, uh, 17 times 1070 hours, right? Minimum. Tell our coaches, if you hit two out of three, last time I checked, that's a D, right? We expect to beat our goals in all three of those areas. So competition's the thing that's outward facing, but those two at Missouri Western are just as important. Um, I'd also mention on the enrollment, most if not all of the athletes that are here would not be at Missouri Western if it wasn't for athletics. We don't have open tryouts. Our walk-ons are recruited. We do have some students that have walked onto a program, very few um, that were already here. If you follow recruiting they say, I just received a, it's big right now because signing day is coming up. I received a PWO, if you see that on Twitter, a PWO from X amount school, that's preferred walk-on. That's a recruiting piece too. So it's your, you have your scholarship athletes, you have your preferred walk-ons, and then you have walk-ons, which is truly someone on campus. Hey, I think I can play, come through. We have very few of those uh, at Missouri Western. This is, this is why the economic model works, right? So football team, 124 student athletes, 36 scholarships is what MIAA and Division II institutions can give for football. So you do the math, 34 scholarships between 124 student athletes on the athletic side, baseball, 45 on the roster, eight scholarships. You go on down the line and you can see how that adds up. This is 1920 numbers. Okay, so we're grown. Uh, so actually our student athlete count will rise. The athletic percent will actually decrease or it should, um, but we're in the middle of the year, so we don't have those final numbers. So the average aid is about 28%. The average athlete that's on scholarship and Missouri Western Athletic is 28%. It's about $5,000. So you say, well, where does, that, where does that fit? Because in Division II, we're all, in, in this league at least, everybody has 10 basketball scholarships. So when you make that number, it's really how many are you rostering on your basketball team? If you have 10 kids and 10 scholarships, I guess everybody could have a full scholarship. We have 17 men's basketball players, right? So, and that came out to 9.65. So where does that rank? It shows you we're in the lower third of Division II. Uh, and right at the 39th percentile of MIAA. So what that means is we're not over awarding athletes from a roster side. That's a delicate balance. You want enrollment, right? But you also have to also have the retention and the experience that a coach with a limited staff can keep those athletes engaged so they stay here and have an enjoyable time and don't transfer out. I talked a lot about graduation rate difference. So an investment in athlete year over year, return on investment is big. This is a different graph. This is the difference between the graduation rate of student athletes in Missouri West are non-student athletes. And it's in the 97th percentile of 320 division two institutions. It's 33% is the difference uh, between that. So I, I heard some in the twenties was, was mentioned that, you know, I, I've, I know we're at 68% um, and that's federal. Okay. Uh, we want to get over 70. Okay. That's our goal. We, we all have goals of that. I will tell you that it's a recruiting piece for us. Our, our four year average, of student athlete graduation is the highest in the MIAA. So you look around, Northwest is probably very close to us on the athletic side, but we're right there. And so we take a lot of pride in that. Um, and Missouri Western has had a history of that. And part of that goes through a lot of things that were mentioned here, um, but retention rates are higher, graduation rates are higher. So more than likely we want to be hundred percent, but the athlete that signs here as a freshman is to go through five years, four years of playing, maybe that fifth year, of not, they are getting all the way across the finish line um, when they're done. GPAs, we're transparent about this. We've had a heck of a run. Everybody's over a 3.0 this past fall, except football. Football's never been over a 3.0 at Missouri Western. When Matt Williamson took over, that GPA was 2.4. It's gone up every single semester he's been here. The expectation is everybody's over a 3.0. Every one of these sports has gone up. We're proud of it. Um, we've had six straight record setting semesters and it's something we measure, uh, every single year. And our coaches know that. And I put this up here because they're good numbers, but they need to go up. Our goal was to get over 3.2 as a GPA when we started our strategic plan, um, three years ago. And our goal is to be there in five years. We were about a two nine or a three Oh one, somewhere around there back in, uh, early 17, we did it in two and a half. Right. So now Let's get to 3.25. Let's get to 3.3. Um, so that's goal. Coaches uh, start that support services. 
all of those things um, for our student athletes. Okay, how the expenses rank. So this is pure operating expenses. I've taken out salaries and I've taken out cost of aid. Okay, this is what the budget is. 2.52 million is not our budget. Daryl can tell you that. That's our actual spend in 18-19. Why did I put up 18-19? That was the last full year we had. It's also the NCAA is way behind. Uh, you submit your prior year on January 15th then they put up all these numbers and you can benchmark it. So I don't have 19-20 uh, for, for everybody else. I do for, for us, but not where we rank. So you look, the amount of student athletes and programs we're supporting in the league, 75th percentile. We're one of the highest uh, sports sponsorship institutions in the MIAA as we looked at the growth. Our budget on the spend of 2.52 would be just above the lower third. I'll tell you that uh, we also fundraise more money for that number than most MIAA institutions. That'll be the next slide for you. Um, so here's the fundraising. This is not fundraising for a building. This is not fundraising for a scholarship. This is general operations. Every institution has to report to the NCAA the revenues that come from outside parties that fund that spend, that 2.52. I use a three-year average because it varies differently on different initiatives of, of our peers. And if you squint, you can really see it. On average, over the last three years, um, Missouri Western between cash and trade toward general operations, 1.15 million have gone into that. So, uh, and then the MIAA averages about 700,000 just over. So that's cash and trade. So it's just under a million dollars in cash each year and trade of about 225,000. We're fragile in our operation. Um, we're proud of this and the community engagement to be able to support it. But we are fragile, right? We have a lot of student athletes to support. Um, we don't have near the biggest budget in this league, and we rely on this instead of student fees to fund it. Um, and our coaches are proud of that, but it is fragile. I want to talk about lacrosse before we get into some questions. And, and I went through, I, I think there's two, two initiatives that I know this board is, has undertaken have been very public for the institution uh, that, that have launched this year. The first is lacrosse. And, and so you didn't see the scholarship numbers in there. We have 25 student athletes uh, right now uh, with about an equivalency right around seven. Our goal and what we present to the board for our model is 9.9 is .9 scholarships with a roster of a minimum of 30. That is our goal for year two. We've blown out year one out of the water. Um, Rachel has done an amazing job and we'll have 30 plus student athletes on that roster coming through. 25 student athletes on this initial roster, 16 transferred to Missouri Western, 12 different states, one Canadian province, um, from New York to California to Missouri and in between. Um, people ask, where in the heck would you play when we launched this? Where would you play lacrosse? Well, we're in the GLVC, we found a home. Members in the GLVC include William Jewell, Rockhurst, Missouri s and Truman State, Lindenwood, a lot of places that, that people recognize. Our lacrosse team is going on a voluntary uh, trip they fundraise for to Colorado to play two teams this year in non-conference play. If you take that out, their conference schedule, they don't travel further than St. Louis to play. Lacrosse is big in this area. We're just the first public institution to sponsor it. Private school, the school across the river, Benedictine, they lost the national championship at the NAI level. And all of those small private schools around us in the NAI sponsor women's lacrosse. Why? It's the fastest growing sport in the country. It's enrollment growth. It has great ROI. Um, so we're excited. They actually will play their first matches here in just a, just a few weeks, 13 game schedule. We're on great track to be revenue positive. Um, we expect to have positive ROI when all programs, salaries, expenses, um, are taken away to be over 200,000 this first year. That's ahead of schedule as well. I will definitely report that to the board when it's finalized. Um, but the numbers after the first semester were ahead of that, but we also haven't traveled and spent money on that piece yet either. So uh, it's a spring sport. I do wanna show a video. I, I hope um, I'm, I tried to speak quickly, but I think this is an important thing to see what you guys have invested in as, as board of governors. Thank you. 
felt so much pressure at the division one level and I wasn't having fun at all like the last time I really like enjoyed playing lacrosse was probably in high school like I just wanted to have fun again and like being here so far everything has been so much fun get out wide give her an option your injuries don't prove your story yeah I got a lot to finish I have a lot to finish too my family myself and the people that look up to me. Give some two, one, two! Yes! I'm excited for that new experience of getting that goal of having that first year program that proves something. And just keeping our head held high no matter what because it's not going to be easy. You can build something from the ground up. I know it's going to be hard, but um, I was excited about that. I feel like our expectations change every single day. So, you know, before it was field a team, then it was, okay, just get the girls here and hopefully we'll play. Now it's, we're definitely playing the season. What are we going to do? And I'm a I think we have the potential to do some really great things. The mindset our staff has going in for the spring is get through it the best we can. And, I mean, that could take on so many different forms. It could be that we just survive and play every game. Or it could be that we win the games we're supposed to win right now based on just roster comparisons, and we do pretty well, and we don't finish last in the conference. Or it could be we exceed all expectations, upset one team, and, you know, we're going to the GLBC Conference Championship as a first-year program. Like, I, there are so many different outcomes that I don't know what to expect or what to fight for because, honestly, at this point, we'd be happy with anything. Uh, done an amazing job. Most programs, um, you know, you're recruiting two years out and most programs that start launch a program and then start it uh, two years later. We were a bit accelerated on that. She was hired in January of last year, uh, built this roster um, with, with transfers and some late high school signees and, and now they're playing. Uh, but she was part of inaugural program at Maryville, which Dr. Mace came to us from in St. Louis. She is part of an agro program at Lynn University. So she's had that in her blood to build. And now she's got a program of her own and she's a great, great young coach. Um, so, so we're definitely excited about, about lacrosse and, um, and what they're able to do. And they've been a great, great addition to our athletic department uh, in, in the institution. Esports is the other initiative um, that's launched. And for those of you that have been on the board, really, this is a launch that $650,000 was um, gifted toward uh, esports 
to launch this program. We won't utilize all of that. Um, but that's what we've utilized this year, what, the, what we have before we start looking at things I just showed you on the athletic side. What is that sustainable ROI, right? It's engagement, it's culture, it's branding right now. It is getting in with the high schools. And then in year two and beyond, we'll start measuring, okay, who's here at Missouri Western from eSports that wasn't here before, right? There's multiple phases of this. This is the beautiful thing about eSports. There's the rec side. That's why we're building that arena in bloom where you're a general student you came here to be a chemistry major you like gaming that's something for me to do and stay engaged and i don't need to compete on a team i just want to have access to some cool stuff and some stuff to do then there's the club sports the club esports where hey maybe i don't want to um, be as intense uh as a varsity esports athlete and do the practices and everything that goes on similar to an ncaa traditional sport athlete but I want to be involved and have a team. And so there's the club element. And then there's the varsity side that actually is wearing the Missouri Western uniform, competing um, and going forward. They started to compete this fall. In fact, uh, you know, I see there was a rivalry weekend with two other uh, established esports programs, which we will blow out of the water uh, probably by next year. But Central Missouri and Northwest both have esports programs. They teamed up with our upstart program in November and had a rivalry weekend of, of different competitions. So it's great to already build rivalry with um, several schools in the area that are rivals of us in football and basketball and other sports as well. Um, nearly 200 students engaged. Uh, I think when we dedicate this arena later this semester, um, it'll be wonderful for the board and the public to hear from Christian, our esports director and coach uh, about how he's built this. And he, he's very talented and uh, is going to do a great job. But it's similar from athletic director standpoint. You hire a first year coach, there's never a competitive expectation. It's just not. It's culture, it's getting the roster right, it is building that. Then you start looking at the competitive pieces in year two. It's all, and that's what we're doing here. Year one is this piece. Then year two, it goes through building that and all the sustainable growth, the competition piece, and all of that. Um, so I'll open up for questions. Still have a few minutes. Josh, I've got a question. The video you just showed us, can that be shared? Can, can you get that? Your I can. I, I can uh, get it to Betsy Link. It's on YouTube. Um, Ryan Minley did a great job. He just uh, put that out on social media, I think, late last week uh, in advance of their season. And and we'll continue to update their kind of their first-year story and, and put that together. But, yes, happy to share that with you. Josh, maybe it's a, a comment and then a, a question uh, what, from someone who is also uh, attacked by the uh, uninformed on social media, like about editing lacrosse and whatnot. When you're putting all those states up there, to make sure that I'm clear, when we have student athletes coming here from non bordering states, uh, that tuition is different, right? Out-of-state tuition rate, um, there are some discounts, as we mentioned, it's not full scholarship discounts, right? Living on campus, the entire lacrosse team lives on campus, just like 90% of our student athletes. Um, yes, and so you're getting a student from California um, that is coming here to engage in lacrosse and their studies and be involved, but uh, is paying an out-of-state rate and living in our dorms and eating in our um, cafeteria and, um, you know, from a tuition and enrollment and revenue side, I mean, that that's a piece of it. It's a win-win. It's, it's a major win-win. I mean, and, and, and those questions are fair because most people assume, I won't say in this room, but most people assume the Missouri Western is kind of, it's, it's different than Mizzou, but yeah, they're all in scholarship and it, that's just not, that's not the way it works. It's not the way it works in anywhere in division two. It's not just us. That's, that's not the model. Diversity of lacrosse is, um, thanks for bringing that up and reminding me. That this has been a, a great team uh, to, to add within our university community. The, the diversity in women's lacrosse is not much. I think it's the, the least diverse sport in the NCAA. I think um, three or 4% are non-white. Um, our team at last check was, I, I think, 17 to 20% um, did not identify as white female. And so from a diversity standpoint, we have been able to um, 
capture recruiting base as well that um, that fits what our athletic department as a whole and our campus as a whole values and, and is as well. And I think that's part of a, a public regional public institution. We, in this area of the country, there are other public institutions that have across, particularly on the, in the South and on the East, but in this area, it is private institutions in Missouri Western. So you can have a sticker price of Maryville. What's the, what's the sticker price? With housing, 38. With housing yeah. 38,000 for starters before anything comes through or for starters, we're a much different rate. And that's, that's Maryville's in our league, right? That's who we're recruiting against. So from a cost of attendance standpoint, it's attractive to come to a public institution to play lacrosse when your competitors are starting at a much different price tag uh, than we are. Competitive advantage for us. And, and my question though, that I had then, you, you have in there the strategic plan for uh, 20 to 25 mm -hmm. uh, on there. Art, do you have, I mean, what is, not trying to put you on the spot, but some visions of, of uh, I mean, there's a lot of, you know, nice comments in there, but I mean, as far as athletics, whether it's, is, is there opportunities for us to add more sports uh, in the right situation going forward? Uh, are there, what are uh, some specifics you think we maybe need to look at from a rec uh, uh, yeah. sports aspect uh, to, to uh, help either recruit or retain students here? Another great question. I'll say from a strategic plan piece, I mean, obviously there's the competitive goals right here, the R city thing, that's a piece of our plan and, and ties to the general broader university mission of getting ingrained in this community. The academic piece, we're, we're ahead of schedule, so we'll be readjusting um, those moving forward and, and sustaining that. From, from sport addition, uh, there, is, there, is, there are possibilities. Um, we, we do have Title IX considerations with, with what we'd add there. Um, there, there are some that would make economic sense, may not make the most sense from us from a Title IX perspective. I, that's why I go back to rec services and focus. I, I do think our, um, our greatest short-term focus can be the growth of our club, competitive club and rec sports. I, I think that there is so much opportunity there. And we really have two club sports that I would consider true club sports that year in and year out are playing competition against other established club programs. It's men's soccer. They'll play Kansas, Wichita state, Kansas state uh, every year. They'll play, we turn on the lights. They heck they practice with our, their practice players for our women's team. They, um, they go through there and then, then we have a bowling club as well that um, that's pretty established and, and we need more of that. And, Dr. Mace comes from uh, a school where there's a very robust esports program, a very robust club sports, um, and, and a lot of intercollegiate athletics as well. But I think that's a, a big opportunity for us strategically here in the next several years. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Lee. And last but not least, I know we are almost closing out the day. We do have one final presentation from Dr. Jones. I'm going to keep him to his 10 minutes so we can close out on time. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so I made a point to tell her that she only mentioned the time frame when it came to me, but, um, and, and I hate to admit, I don't have a very moving video that was very well done, but kudos to you, Josh. Um, but I can probably get some emotions out of you because I'm the last of the nine presenters on the cabinet. So that should make you feel better. And then I only have four slides. So it, it, it should make, that, that should help you see the end of the tunnel. Um, so yes, yeah, so uh, I am Logan Jones. I started here in 2015 as a faculty member. Um, and uh, 17, 18, I, I had the opportunity to take on as Dean of what at the time was the Craig School of Business by itself. It eventually very quickly, um, actually before I ever took over, became the Craig School of Business and Technology because we added engineering technology. Um, and then over the process, we've added several different roles, including um, the one that I'm here to t discuss with you. The responsibilities with this role, this it's an, it's an, 
uh, added duties, we'll say, is more around, it really centers on two different things. So I still have all the duties of being a dean of one of the academic colleges. Um, but the other two pieces to this are the strategic initiatives um, of the university as a whole. Uh, and, then, and then a few centers that I'll discuss that are or a couple centers that I'll discuss that are, are university wide. They don't really fit um, in a division. They're, they, they kind of span the whole university. And that's the, um, I guess that's kind of the point of this position. I think when it started, it very much was, um, and you'll have to forgive me because my area of management or my area of business is, is management. And in teaching a principles course, the, the basic concept of a, like a boundary spanning position, something that goes across laterally or vertically uh, in an organization, outside of the organization, like this, this is what I'm doing now. Um, it's, it, I am the uh, epitome of that, I guess, because I still hold uh, all the way down to the faculty rank chair. I'm actually the chair of the business school, the dean, and then also this new um, role on the cabinet. The point of it was that um, when it comes to strategic initiatives at the university level, we have, um, if it's something within, um, if it's something within, a given uh, division under a vice president, then the vice president would, would be the one that would look after it. But if it's something that goes across the divisions, again, university-wide, then you kind of need a champion. And that was one of the things, ever since I've been here, I've mentioned to multiple people is that we just, we don't have enough champions. Like that's, would be my opinion that, that we want to take up things um, and either begin them and then eventually hand them off to someone else or, or, or take them from beginning to end when it comes to you know, a strategic priority or strategic initiative for the institution. So in my role, again, I have academic units. This is the Dean's role, uh, three different centers and the Law Enforcement Academy. And then the separate pieces is, is, are the strategic initiatives. So part of this was taking up where the last administrator was at with, with some of the, the, um, the strategic initiatives from the last administration that we're carrying forward. Um, so the Griffin Guaranteed Scholarship, eSports, Gold Friday, um, Center for Service, uh, and then the Center for Military and Veterans Services. Now, two of these, because they do fit in the division pretty well, um, I'm not responsible for. So Josh mentioned eSports, it fits with rec management and athletics. So I, that's not one of the initiatives that I, that I kind of look after. Uh, the same thing with the Griffin Guarantee Scholarship now that Melissa's here and very happy that she's here. Her and Daryl are working on and fine tuning that, that scholarship, which was one of the initiatives that carried forward. The things that we are kind of measuring um, and moving forward are uh, the Gold Friday, the Center for Service, and again, the, the Military and Vet Center. Right now, where we're at is largely, I mean, it's largely because of COVID, it's very hard to measure kind of the success of these things. So what we're doing is we're trying to find new ways um, to, to gain value from these initiatives until we get to a point, hopefully post COVID, where we can measure their success or failure and whether this is something we want to continue to do as a, as a strategic initiative. <coughs> At the same time, we want to add initiatives. So a couple, a few examples um, of those, and I would say most of the ones we're looking at, again, that go across the whole institution are around uh, recruiting and retention, partnerships, um, looking at different ways we can serve the region, right? So a couple of those in terms of the partnership category that, that we're well on our, I mean, we're probably halfway into um, is one is with the 139th Air Wing. So we've established, I've, I've helped establish certain courses for them. So we have eight week courses now that are available to, to the Air Guard uh, members. And then also we're going to do um, recruiting at uh, two different events. So twice a year we register, we advise and register students for the upcoming semesters. So twice a year we will go out for a couple different months before that starts to the Air Wing on their drill dates. And we're going to um, actively try to get them to the institution and also register for classes, answer questions, do those things. And again, just working on better partnerships with them. The second one is, is one that we've, we're just now getting some legs under, which is with Hilliard Technical College. Um, 
we were working through our, we have, we've always had some established articulation agreements. Um, in my opinion, and largely because I didn't have anything to do with them before, so I can kind of talk bad about them. But the, the reality is, is they were a great example of in the past how Missouri Western tries to overcomplicate things and for very good reasons, don't get me wrong, but they really um, make it difficult or create hurdles for, for students to get to us. So what we're doing is we're, we're streamlining those to just a GPA option and some other requirements, finish your program at Hilliard. And then when you come here, before we gave you block credit, we gave you this, here's 12 hours worth of credit. What we're moving to now is an actual evaluation of the content at Hilliard and we'll give you credit for courses. So you get direct um, transfer credit for these courses. And, and there's two reasons for that. First, it makes it a lot easier for Hilliard to, to market and sell this to students on why their Education is important because they can get credit with us. Um, and then the second thing is, is again, it, it applies to way more things than, than block credit does or elective credit. Because some programs, there's not a lot of, you don't have a lot of students have a lot of use for elective credit. Um, and then the, the last thing uh, in my 10 minutes is up is workforce <laughs> development. So um, in Ju July 1st, I helped open the, the workforce Center for Workforce Development, which is actually under the business school, but some strategic initiatives related to that, which again, still reports to me, is that we're trying to expand it. So right now, um, there's lots, there's over 200 different online training courses you can take. They're non-credit courses, they're affordable and a variety of topics. And this goes back to just trying to serve the region better and to try to listen to what people need and offer things up. The expansion will be um, probably mid to late uh, in the spring. This spring, we will be offering a face-to-face -face cohort training for professional sales. And this was directly from several different businesses in town that, and, and as was mentioned by the provost, like I have very strong advisory groups in the college and all of them want sales training. So this will be a way for us to provide sales training. And it'll be a nine week program, largely taught by practitioners. So we've got an automobile, uh, real estate, insurance with people that are no sales that are going to come and teach this again for a set fee. It's not credit bearing. So we can have who we believe are, are qualified to teach this, teach this program. Um, but we'll be launching that later on this spring. And then another thing out of the Workforce Development Center that's been pretty recent is um, the Community Alliance and in partnership with United Way, we will be looking at offering a, um, a neighborhood leadership. So part of the 2040 plan through the chamber was to create more you know, leadership in neighborhoods and, and have neighborhoods really take an active part in, 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 um, in their neighbors or in, in our city. So they've asked us to create kind of a, a servant leadership or a neighborhood leadership type program, which we'll be doing, uh, we're in the process of doing right now, the, the beginning of it. Um, that's kind of where we're at, some examples. I'll be happy to ask or answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Yeah, so I'll probably hear about the timepiece for the rest of my life, but I will say Logan is my very favorite special assistant. So I'm very happy about that. Okay. Let me get, uh, let's see. Okay. So those are our presentations for today. I hope you found them very interesting. I want to just give you a few more thoughts and then, uh, and then we can close out the day. Um, first of all, uh, as we talked about, uh, you know, today's retreat was to provide an overview of the university's structures, their functions, and to provide a beginning set of reference materials for you in your work as a, a governor on our board. What we expect to do next time is um, through our new general counsel, Kelly Douglas, we'll be doing more formal training um, related to uh, orientation about duties, roles, operating procedures, as well as some of the responsibilities that Kelly touched on a little bit with you. But before we conclude, there's just a couple of things I wanted to point out to you. You will notice, and I think some of the cabinet members mentioned to you, that they got up multiple times. I did that deliberately to point out to you that we have four cabinet members who are doing two cabinet level jobs or other jobs in the university. 
We are an incredibly lean machine working incredibly hard to make sure the university runs as efficiently as possible. And it's important to note that. Now, we do have planning. We are working forward to see what our final organizational structure are. But I was asked to move the university forward to maintain our strategic initiatives, and we are doing something. We have added Dr. Mace and, Dr. and Kelly Douglas, so I'm very excited about that. So um, I'm sure we will have ongoing conversations in that regard. Also, before we close, I would like to give a very huge thank you to Betsy, to Kendi in Marketing and Communications, to Jessica, to Dana, to Corey and all the IT staff, Mike, uh, to Physical um, Plants, all the folks who helped make this day possible for us. Thank you to Aramark for a delicious lunch, as always. Uh, it was wonderful. Um, and also, finally, to yet again, our governors who devote their time and effort, their precious resources to our success, and finally, again, to my cabinet. I am so very fortunate to have a group of very talented, very dedicated, very hardworking folks who are willing to do and work and talk and think and plan and use their best creative energies that they have. And I feel very fortunate to have them as my colleagues. So thank you for your attention today. Um, and that concludes our session. <laughs>